Yeah, hi. Uh, yeah, hi, I'm Kevin Jans. I'm the creator of YGS. And uh, yeah, so Seth, or Seth asked me to, I just jump in, uh, Seth, do you want to introduce yourself? <laughs> really sure, bad yeah, at this. <laughs> I, um, I, I don't know, like I, I worked in, I made uh, a ShareJS and ShareDD back in the day and worked in Google Wave years ago. And um, uh, I've been realizing that CRDT is really cool. And um, so yeah, I asked Kevin if he would be willing to take me through a tour of the YGS source code because it's really sweet. And um, I'm really impressed with what he's done. So um, yeah, and then we've also got Mike. You want to introduce yourself, Mike? Um, I'm very interested in synchronization and the future of the web. And um, I'm, I think YJS is really great software. And so I'm stoked to learn a little bit about it before I fall asleep. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. We, uh, we, the three of us uh, um, are in, <laughs> I'm in Australia, Kevin's in, in Germany, and Mike's in America, so we're on opposite corners of the world. And Mike ended up drawing this short straw in terms of timing. <laughs> I'm going to be the guy who puts you in bat, Mike. Um, I hope I'm not too boring. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you won't be. Um, yeah. Uh, you want to All right. Jump into this? Yeah. Go for it. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. Um, all right, uh, so this is the YJS code base, and it looks awful to me now because everything is so big. Um, <laughs> oh my god, how can I walk through this? Uh, so uh, this is the YJS project. Uh, there's a source folder. We're going to talk about the things that are in this fo source folder. Um, so um, just a short overview. Let's keep these open. Uh, there are the YJS types. Like if you if you're chiming into this um, this um, well a recording I guess uh, then I hope you are a bit familiar with how the YJS type system works. So there are uh, types in YJS uh, that you can uh, manipulate and sync automatically with other people, um, and there is uh, some utility stuff here. The important thing here is the doc uh, class that is here. So this is basically the Y doc, and Structs is what the YJS document is made out of. Um, so I thought um, we could maybe start with the text type because it's obviously the most interesting thing uh, and uh, talk about how the <clears throat> how text is represented in YJS and then go into details how um, how the CRDT structure works and how we can send these data to other peers and we're probably going to cycle back to the types and to the item class a lot. And there are lots of problems that we need to discuss several times. So we're going to jump back and forth between different classes. And uh, you just ask away questions if you have any. Um, sure. Uh, I'm sure so, you do. <laughs> so just, I already do. Uh, so just for context. So we've got uh, a document. And then a document can contain the different structs that you've got. Um, and then there's also the types. So how does, so like, What's the relationship between like uh, a document and structs versus types? Like, how are they different? Yes. Um, okay. So a document is basically a collection of types. Uh, you can go into um, I don't know. Uh, you can you will create a new y dot doc right, mm -hmm. and um, and on this y doc you can define types. For example, you can do like get text, and then gives this type a, a name, and everyone who um, who defines the text type in the same manner, like with this name, mm. um, will um, share data with you. And this is a bit weird, this concept. It may make sense in, uh, later. But uh, the idea is basically that you have these top level types um, that you can just define. Then you can use them, you can structure your data. Um, and there's an event system that works on the YGS document. Mm. And the YGS document is also like the um, it's basically a collection of updates that you can send to other peers. Um, so this is what the YDoc is about. You could also just implement YJS, I guess, as just types, but um, you have more flexibility um, if you implement it as a collection of types and there's really no difference in that. Yeah, um, so, so yeah. all right. So is that, would that create a, a like YDoc.name property? Is that the kind of idea? Yeah. Um, yeah, so yeah, to define yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Cool. And um. And so that would define that would use the the Y text type, as opposed to the right. the content string type, or the content string struct. Yeah. Uh, so this would define the type, right? Mm -hmm. Um. And on this type, 
um, you have um, this type is a view on the CRDT model, and it's a very special right. view. Um, with the, the CRDT model just consists of item objects, I guess. So everything that is um, basically um, you have the types, and they are a view on the on the items. Um, you, the types are responsible for extracting the information from the item structure, which is basically a linked list, and um, representing that to the user. So if you if you have a white text type, you can, for example, define uh, a lot of items with a content string, which is basically the main use case here. But you can also give um, you can also place some uh, content formats, which will uh, which are used for defining which text meaning. And um, I mean, there are a bunch of uh, content types. Um, they are basically responsible for encoding documents, uh, encoding content. Cool. Yeah. So could could text contain anything, or is it limited specifically to strings and formatting for which text? It should like Y text should yeah. only contain text and formats and embeds. Embed mm -hmm. is, I, I, you know what embed is, but like in the which text uh, Delta format, you have these embed things where you can, for example, define an image with a location um, or anything else, right? And so YJS basically supports the rich text Delta format that Seth created, which I think is pretty cool. Cool. Um, uh, yeah, I, I didn't make that. I worked with Jason Chen to make that, who ended up making Quill.js that, um, yeah, that ended oh, up selling okay. to Salesforce of all people. But yeah. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Uh, then no kudos to you. Um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I know him. We chatted about it, and he was like keen to do it with me. Uh, yeah, he's a cool guy. <laughs> You'd like him. Awesome. I, I mean, you made a lot of cool things happen. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So we have this uh, white text type, and basically anything is uh, any type is an abstract type. So white text is a view on the type, and abstract type is an implementation of the type. And um, yeah, so it inherits. I think there's nothing in, really interesting here. So um, maybe two string, for example, just iterates through the structs. Uh, so this is an item. Then it iterates through the struct. And extracts all the strings and re returns that as a uh, as a collection, right, or as a string. Um, so, so all of the content inside this is represented in a linked list. Yeah, everything is a linked list, and this is maybe a bit confusing. So, um, the the thing is, like at, at the beginning when I created YJS, um, I I knew about all the different uh, CRTTs that you ha can have, but I thought, okay. I'm mainly interested in sequence CRDTs because that's the hard part. I want to solve correlated editing on the web. So um, I implemented this really awesome um, sequence CRDT. And uh, then I just added um, more functionality. For example, I added map type and also XML structures using the list CRDT. And the reasoning is that implementing a CRDT is pretty, co pretty complex, right? Uh, there are a lot of things that you need to think about. And if concurrency happens, there are a lot of weird things that can happen, transformations and all these optimizations in YJS, the encoding, uh, like a lot of stuff happens. So it makes sense just to implement a single algorithm and use that for different things. And um, I mean, this is why the code size of YJS is really small, because um, everything is just item. Like really everything is made of of items and maybe the GC struct, but um, yeah, this is the whole idea here. Maybe it makes sense later. Um, it's it's really <laughs> not that complicated. Um, okay. So it's not like this cool GSET stuff and you know. Okay. We did something s similar with a CRDT where like we'd have a, a map would be implemented as, well, every value in that map would be a sequence of length one basically, and it would have its own, con because the conflicts that you would get in a map would be two people setting the same value. Mm -hmm. And so the conflicts only have to be resolved on the value itself. And so we would just resolve that using a sequence and then only choose the first item of that to resolve a conflict. Is that kind of uh, how you do this too? Exactly, that, that's exactly the idea. The only difference being that in YJS it's the last item, but uh, <laughs> exactly, yeah, that's it. Uh, so this is a braid. 
Um, this is how you implemented Braid? Yeah, well, this is in uh, this uh, Sync9 CRDT. Okay. It's like kind of, kind of part of the Braid project, but it's not Braid itself. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, yeah, so yeah, this is exactly the idea. So you have um, text types and then you have maps. Maybe we can just go there. And actually, map is also an instance of abstract type, right? There's nothing special here. Um, everything is an abstract type. And an abstract type defines um, a list CRDT always. There's always a property that defines the start of a list CRDT. And also it has this map property here, which defines a mapping from some arbitrary string. You need to define that beforehand uh, to a list CRDT. Uh, and this refers to the last item in the list CRDT. And this is in order to make some optimizations happen. So whenever you want to um, overwrite this property, you're going to append an item to this list CRDT. Yeah, uh, cool. Um, now we got that out of the way. I thought this would be <laughs> the most confusing part. Um, yeah, so um, like I have this, uh, I, I wrote actually basically in my, I, I closed the window, damn it. Okay, basically in my, in my, in my um, in my bachelor in my studies um, uh, when I my bachelor thesis was about the CRDT so I created the CRDT as my bachelor thesis and later we published a paper about it and um, uh, there are a few things that um, that I explained in this paper first it is the list CRDT that is based on a visual model to represent changes uh, this is a list CRDT basically it's a linked list of items and there are also some additional properties like this left and right property. And this is still present in there. And then there's a proof that, which is complete nonsense. You should never trust a proof, um, especially in this field. Uh, it's still a cool proof and a lot of uh, people have done it, but I show that it's basically anti-symmetric, transitive and total, like it doesn't show anything in my opinion. Um, okay, and there's the insert algorithm, which changed a lot. It's much more efficient right now. Um, there was a garbage collection scheme that I talked about. Also, like just on Twitter, there was a big discussion about this garbage collection scheme. And um, there are cool things about it, but yeah, I eventually removed it. Uh, performance here. And this is where I explained this. Um, uh, so you have this replace manager, and it basically points to the first item uh, of, the, of the list. And this is how I do conflict resolution. So this is where this originally was defined. Um, uh, if you want to read it up, um, there are some additional concepts defined in here. Also, how you can represent an XML type using two list CRDTs. Yeah, all right. Uh, sorry to go over that, but I just wanted to give a short overview eventually. Um, um, yeah. So, do you want to sorry. go dive into? Uh, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> I, I just want to ask a bunch of like little questions. So, we've got this abstract yeah. type, and then we've yeah. got text and map and array that all inherit from this. and like I assume the Y XML element and all does all that stuff inherit from this as well? Um, yeah, I'm just it, looking it in also there. inherits from episode. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So um, we have this map type. We have this uh, mm -hmm. start of a sequence. The XML element. Yeah, actually, I guess we can. Start of, okay, maybe we can I, okay. talk about the XML stuff afterwards. It is probably going to be yeah. Okay, 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 uh, okay. So what is so so start? So we've got so every um every type contains a list internally, and the whole thing's built on top of lists. Uh -huh. So um, so start is the first item in the list, and then it's a linked list from there. Um, so the the map that map uh, that's just like a um, utility, so that if the abstract type is actually storing uh, like a map, um, then mm -hmm. then that way you can look up the value that has like the last value in order this particular key. Is that right? Exactly. Yeah, you can use a map in different scenarios. Also, the mm -hmm. y text type could use a map for different things. For example, in order to represent some meta information on the text, if you define it in the text type or if you define your own text type. Yeah, and then what's item? Item, yeah, um, it's an item. So um, a, type is <laughs> a type is also an item. So uh, there was a time when abstract type would just inherit from item. And now the item links to type uh, so the uh, the item links to the type and the type links to item. So it's basically this 
this weird double link. Um, it makes sense. Um, but um, so basically, you can embed a type within the structure, for example, within a Y array type in order mm -hmm. to nest your document. And uh, this is why abstract type is also an item. So you can. Sorry, uh, sorry, within a Y. Sorry, so when, when might you use that? I, I'm still confused. Uh, yeah, I know, I know, sorry. Um, so basically, um, an abstract type is also an item. If you, you can nest a document, you can define a folder structure with YJS. Mm -hmm. And the idea now is that you have this uh, shared Y array type um, where you can define a bunch of files. Um, you can name them and you can define the text files, for example, as Y text types. Mm -hmm. And so the text type would be um, a child of the Y array. And um, then a weight text type needs to be an item on a, in order to resolve concurrency if there are concurrent insertions of uh, text files. It's all right. Uh, not yet. Uh, we'll get there. Uh, so, all right. So, let's say we've got, so we've got a folder structure. So, I've got a mm -hmm. directory and that's got some files in it. So, to represent that, I would have, uh, I would have a, a list type, uh, an array type to be able to use the, the folder. Uh, like, oh, sorry, no, a map, would, a map type, sorry. So a map the, type would be better. Yeah, yeah no, that would make right. more sense. Like, yeah, yeah, no, you're right. Yeah, yeah so, so map, yeah, and then the keys would be the file names or something, and then map to, exactly. yeah, great. It, okay, so that makes sense. So so when would the item property come in? Or like, yeah. like what does that bring so in? Basically, what you would do is, um, so in the map type, um, which is this one, um, you would um, define a file name, and if there is nothing present, you would just set create a new item Mm -hmm. um, you would just create it, and here's the item definition. Uh, there are a bunch of properties, but basically content is abstract content. Abstract content um, is basically any of these, content any, content binary, and there's mm -hmm. also content type. So content of an item can be a type. Um, and this is what is defined here. So basically, uh, the content type is um, holds the type definition, which is an abstract type. So you can insert arbitrary content in, into the nested document structure. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and then what, what's the item property inside abstract type? And is that, is that the type? Is that the content type? Or like an item which represents the content type or something? An item is um, the representation of the linked list. Uh, it's, it's how we built uh, the list CRDT, yeah, yeah. the sequence CRDT. Yeah. So an item is just one item inside the linked list, right? Right, exactly. Yeah. So then, when you if you go back to the um, the abstract type uh, class, mm -hmm. so you have that this dot underscore item equals null. Um, right, and this would yeah. be like there are two cases. If this is a top level type, for example, mm -hmm. as I did with um, um, as I did with my doc dot get what is that? I don't <laughs> get text. Like sometimes surprising to me. Um, so if this is something like that, if this abstract type is a top level type, then um, it, the item would be null because mm -hmm. it wouldn't be inserted anywhere. It's the top level type, right? In this oh, case, we define- Sorry, so is that item yeah. inherent? Like the containing object? Oh, oh no, it's the item that contains this object. Yeah, the, right? item contains, co the item contains a type. Basically, it can contain yeah. a type if you want to. Right. Exactly. So if I walked if I walked up to the item and then from there to uh, like like does this let me walk up the tree or something? Yeah, you can walk anywhere. Uh, so you can walk do down the list and up the list. Um, okay. Yeah, it's it's a linked list and it's a tree structure that also links to the parents. Um, yeah. Okay. Great. So all right. Sorry. So I'm just going to restate what you said as I understand it, just to check. So if let's say I've got a, a list of um uh, a, a list of strings. Um, so, uh, mm -hmm. so I've got a, a abstract type list. Then each of those items inside my list is going to be an item, obviously, because they're linked list items. But inside exactly. that item is going to be a um, uh, is going to be content. And content mm -hmm. is um, so this is like two objects that reference that reference each other. So the item mm -hmm. in the linked list references the string, and then the string's mm -hmm. item property is back to the item that's the uh, linked list value. Is that right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, great. Okay, got it. That makes sense. Cool. Awesome. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, let's uh, maybe we talked about items so much. Um, 
So yeah, yeah sorry. I, uh, <laughs> want to get no, there. it's. Uh, I think uh, it was so helpful that you just asked a bunch of questions so to make uh, to force me to make it clear, um, <laughs> because this is probably really confusing if you don't see it, right? Um, there was this guy who created um, a visualization of the whole structure, and maybe I can find it and uh, send it uh, to you later. Maybe that would be maybe pretty helpful. But That'd it only cool. represents, yeah. But it only represents the list CRDT, uh, basically mm -hmm. the rich text CRDT. But still, it's uh, pretty cool to see the linked list of items uh, working together. Um, yeah. So, um, man, yeah. Item is the most complicated part of the whole system because it can do so much, and there are so many um, effects. Um, effects like it's really complex because content, as I explained in the um, in my. Uh, in, the, in my blog post, in, in my last blog post, which made you um, like uh, write me an email. Um, so I explained that a single item content uh, item can contain a bunch of content. Hmm. Uh, so um, maybe just just quickly, let, let's go to the abstract content thingy. So it's basically just a definition how content should look like, what methods it should implement. So um, it has a get content method which returns an array of any content. It doesn't really matter what it is, but it returns an array of content. So a single item in the linked list um, um, does not just contain a single item, but a bunch of items, a, a bunch of content things, whatever content is, right? Um, if it is a string, you can define, um, you can define the content as being a, a string of length five, for example, or string of length 10, and then when you need to, if you want to insert within that string, you're going to split up the item and insert within that string. Um, yeah, so if we had a string, would, would the linked list of items just be single characters? Uh, yeah, that's exactly that. No, it's not single characters. If you write text, um, if you write A, B, C, um, mm -hmm. it would be wrapped, it would be wrapped, sorry, right. so yes. it has some ID. Um, mm -hmm. It would be wrapped like this. And now let's assume that Mike wants to insert in the string between character A and B. Mm -hmm. Then I would um, copy this item, basically. Um, insert, uh, delete A, uh, delete B, C. So it's basically it's the same representation, right? It's just, yeah. this is a linked list of items. Item refers to the next item. And then I would insert my, my item within, so with my content, whatever that is. So the important thing here is that one item refers to a bunch of content. Mm -hmm. um, um, it depends if you append content to this, for example, when I continue writing like some numbers here, um, these numbers are just gonna be appended to this item, which makes sense because now you don't have a lot of items um, hanging around and the JavaScript engine doesn't need to maintain all these items. I explained why this is important in this blog post um, because this is really the bottleneck of JavaScript engines. Uh, but, like this is why CRDTs are hard to implement in JavaScript um, because if you create a bunch, a lot of objects, uh, you need to ma um, manage a lot of memory, a lot of small references hanging around in the memory and uh, the garbage collector needs to uh, automatically uh, garbage collect them using some kind of a garbage collection scheme, right? Um, and this uh, this is basically um, the overhead is reduced by this representation by um, representing a bunch of characters um, in a single item. Yeah, and and uh, and so the ID of a particular item, like a, an item's unique name, is the the pair of the uh, client ID and the sequence number, right? Yes. Yes. Uh, where is it? Wait, wait, wait. Not this one. Here it is. Okay, exactly. Uh, so um, something that is really important is this um, ID property. This is how we can refer to content. So this ID doesn't really refer to item, it refers to content. Uh, let's have a short look at how this um, class is implemented. Um, so yeah, as you said, it has a client property and a clock um, or a sequence number, this is a Lamport timestamp. Uh, there are a lot of distributed systems define Lamport timestamp like this. And in, in YJS, the client 
is something that uniquely identifies you as a user or as a website or as as, as a site that opens uh, that is part of the collaborator collaboration right so um I, you could say i'm uh, i'm user one two three four something um internally this number is a 53 bit integer um i choose integers because um, it's a primitive data type that is efficiently represented in memory and 53 bit is probably enough to um to encode anything actually it's a variable length integer you can encode any integer in that up to 64 bit but 64 bit are not really supported uh, yet uh, by javascript in all browsers so this is a 60 uh, variable length integer and the first operation i'm going to create the first content i'm going to create the first character will be identified by this combination of my my user id or client id and the clock being zero and the next content like when i type a b the character a will be identified by uh, client id zero and b will be identified by character id uh, by client id one and and so on does this make sense yeah yeah and so earlier cool. you were talking about um at least it does to me uh my <laughs> Um, so earlier, you were, you were talking about like run length encoding characters. So if, if it was A, B, C, D, then you would just have one item that represents all four of those characters. I assume that mm -hmm. that only works if the four characters are all from the same client and all with like contiguous sequence numbers. Exactly. Yeah. Um, there cool. are there are restrictions to that, but in practice, it makes sense. Um, yeah. Just for just for for example, if you copy paste a bunch of text. Um, you don't want to create a million items just in one go, and if you delete that, you need to uh, create another million items in order to delete them. So no, um, everything is just um, in 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 some cases you need to create more items. Um, yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, cool. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, that's good. <laughs> uh, it's good that it makes sense. Um, so yeah, we have this ID, which, which refers to the first item in content. For, to the, I always say item. Item is so generic. I should name it differently. <laughs> um, so ID refers to the first content in this content, abstract content type, right? So if this is a bunch of characters, it refers to the first character. And if I want to get the second character, I can just do like um, uh, ID um, I, I'm going to define a new ID with ID.client and ID.clock plus one. This will refer to the second um, content inside this thing. And now we have this ability to refer to any content within YJS because everything is an item, everything carries content, and we can refer to any content in YJS uh, forever, um, which is really cool, in my opinion. Uh, yeah. 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 Um and just for like for context, uh so auto merge works the same way. Um instead of calling it a client ID, it calls it an agent ID. And instead of the clock, it calls it a sequence number, but exactly the same idea and they use the same yeah. <laughs> like the same mechanism. Um yeah, yeah, you you can look it up. It's 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 not limited to, to CRDTs. Lamport timestamps are um a, a part of a lot of distributed systems and they're generally uh, really cool because basically it allows you to define um, define uh, uniquely identify everything you do uh, with some unique identifier, and also allows you to give um, give order to the operations you create. For example, you could say, okay, first I click this button and then I move this thingy around. Um, these would be two operations in 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 another system, not in WhiteJS. This would be two operations, and um, when you receive these operations, you could uh, tell okay, this client executed some operations and there's a unique sequence um, because at first I execute clock zero and then I execute, execute clock one, which um, is a requirement in a lot of distributed systems. Yeah, so, um, uh, so if I typed, say, ABC, mm -hmm. that would be clock like zero, one, two, and mm -hmm. then I hit backspace, so I delete one of the characters. Does that deleted character, like, sorry, does the, the act of deleting that character also generate a new clock as well? No, it does not. So um, YGS is really unique in that case because mm. um, 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 
okay, what is the best way to explain my reasoning here? Um, so a deletion is basically just you toggle a, an attribute on this uh, on this item class. If you want to delete a character, you're going to split up the item so it only co contains that character, and then you um, you toggle this flag. So I, I recently um, updated this. So before it was just um, this dot deleted is false. And if you want to make it deleted, you set it to true. But um, because JavaScript um, is, well, that's, it's awesome. I encode a lot of things in a different, in a single integer value. Um, so it's bit three that I'm going to toggle in order to make it deleted. And I sent this operation the the idea the information that I deleted this character to all the other clients, and uh, when I sync with other clients, I always need to tell them which uh, items I deleted. And there's a very very efficient way to encode deletions in a document. It's really really cool. Um, uh, maybe later we can get to that. It, <laughs> sure. Sorry, I'm not taking you off course. Makes, sure. Yeah, and no, no, no. Uh, there's no course here, but uh, it really makes sense to. Go. It's not that interesting, but something you need to know is um, when you sync with another client, you're gonna exchange mm -hmm. items with uh, with each other. So an item is always used to represent content, and it is also the update format. In YJS, there are no operations. Mm -hmm. um, uh, this is more like a struct. Um, it's a part of your document. It's um, it's what builds your document. And if I'm going to sync with you, you're gonna send me all the created all the items that you created that I don't know about. You're gonna send them to me, and I'm gonna send all the items to you that you don't know about. And then what happens is you um, you get all these properties. Uh, these are efficiently encoded, and then you call integrate here. Then you call integrate, and this basically integrates this item into the document structure. So basically, it finds the left and right parent, and if there are conflicts, it handles the markers and um, in, and really inserts it into the linked list. Uh, so yeah, this is where all the magic happens. So all right. So um, but how do so how do I know that you don't know about the delete? So I think maybe this is getting too into the weeds. So like I, I've deleted a character. Right, so I have characters uh, with sequence number zero, one, and two, and then I deleted the last character. So, uh, as far as I know, you, you're up to date because you you know about like you know about zero, one, and two, but you don't know about this deleted operation. Like, how do I know that I need to send it to you? Yeah, at the beginning of a session, you're just gonna send all the delete operations to me. Everything <laughs> okay. that is ever deleted, you send it to me, and this. Um, so YGS is this weird mix of Delta CRDT. I guess that's the hip term right now. Um, so it's a Delta CRDT with the exception that deletions are a state CRDT. Um, okay. Uh, so um, this is a weird mix, but it makes sense because you can represent deletions really, really efficiently. Um, think about, for example, if we have, if you have a lot of content, and most, like, let's say, fifty percent of the content is going to be deleted. Um, I can say um, uh, client, uh, so this client, I'm just going to make it a tuple. This client starting from, um, from clock zero to the same client starting to this operation is going to be deleted. So you can encode a lot of deletions in a single item. And in practice, you can encode this so efficiently that even for huge documents, this is just going to be a few bytes. Um, so um, this is why you always send the whole deletion set to the other client every time you sync with other peers. And this makes also YJS really efficient because you don't represent deletions as an operation or as an, um, I guess, a struct of your document. Yeah, I yeah, I, I'm really curious, like how that's represented. Like, why is it so small? You know. If, yeah, like, um, the, the reason you, for that is, hmm. um, so you basically, um, yeah, this is basically just a range of deletions. And um, so is that saying uh, delete, say, to delete from zero to that number? Is that what that's saying? Yeah, it, it, say, it says that, wait, oh, I forgot that. Um, actually, like the internal, internally, I use um, the encoded format will look like this. 
So starting at this ID, I'm going to remove, let's say, uh, 1900, uh, 1900 um, items. Mm -hmm. And then the next thing is starting from the same ID, um, actually, actually from this clock from 1901, maybe there's something that is still remaining. I'm going to delete another uh, 300 items. Okay. So right. I basically go into the list, um, go into the internal representation, like uh, I, I iterate through all the items that are in the YJS document and um, mark them as deleted as I get this deletion set. And this is really just a bunch of numbers. And as you can notice, and the, the difference here, like between 1900 and 1901, it's just one. So something I do is I encode uh, the difference between these two. Um, so if I delete uh, start from, starting from this position and then continuing here and uh, the next one would be two, uh, two, three. Uh, and let's say it removes this many op operations. I encode this ID, then the length of the deletion length, and then the difference to the next deletion item, yep. uh, which sense. is just one. And then I encode uh, the difference is just four, then the length of this one. And this, this can be encoded so efficiently using RLE encoding and variable length encoding that, um, yeah, it's really just a few bytes, even if there are millions of items deleted. Yeah, yeah uh, works that, great. And, yeah. That, sorry, yeah, that sounds equivalent to another. So I've seen in OT systems, uh, people express operations by saying, um, uh, like, say, an operation might be like skip the first thousand characters, then insert ABC, and then uh, you know, then delete five characters, right? So you might yeah. write that as one thousand comma right in a list, one thousand comma, then uh, ABC in a string. So that means yeah. you insert something comma minus five. And so minus five means that then I delete five characters. And then, yeah, exactly. like, yeah, and then I've seen similar, it's like for what you're doing, right? A similar way of being like, right, mm -hmm. I've got my string, it's this long. And then I just say like 1000, which means I keep the first thousand characters, minus two, I delete the next two characters, 100, I keep the next 100 characters, minus 500, I delete the next 500 characters and just going plus minus plus minus like that. Um, yeah, prefer yeah, which, this is anyway. exactly that. Uh, I think, that's yeah, awesome. I, and also, I, am, I, I was uh, really inspired by the um, OT representation of changes um, quite a lot. So I, I guess this played a role here, um, especially <laughs> at the beginning of the project. Uh, this deletion representation was always part of the project. And I thought it was always one of the coolest things uh, because you can really represent. The main part is like in 90% of the cases, you're going to sync the whole document to the client anyways, right? And you can represent right. deletions very efficiently. If you would just sync the differences, there's so much overhead in creating a deletion. Um, you can encode the whole document structure much more efficiently if you encode deletions as a separate set. Right. Um, yeah, that makes sense. This, yeah, this, this may make more sense later. Uh, but yeah, for cool. now. Sorry, it's, this it's, has been a long, long tangent. I'll, I'll let you <laughs> go back to... Whatever the next thing. Uh, you're no, no, no. That's that's fine. Uh, yeah. So um, maybe we can continue at this item class. Uh, um, I, I said this is a part of the linked list. Uh, mm -hmm. This is that refers to the previous to the item to the left and to the item of the right. So um, something that you do. But let's maybe go through what happens if I insert a character in inside. Uh, well, in a Y text element the Y text element finds a position for me. Uh, basically, it iterates through this linked list, then finds the position to me, finds this left and right parameters, and um, gives that to me so I can use that here. And then the integration process, whenever this happens, uh, here, Doo -doo -doo. it's going to yeah, it's going to reconnect left and right. So basically, it really integrates it into the list. Um, so before, I just defined left and right. And now I'm going to um, redefine the linked list right here. So um, um, this dot left right, I'm going to store that as a reference. And this dot left dot right, I'm going to define as this. So I integrate it into the list, right? 
Uh, I think this is pretty basic, but if you look at this code, it's probably really overwhelming because there's so much going on here. Um, uh, but I hope this is kind of clear. I've, I've seen much, much worse operational transform code that I've written myself, so. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, there are comments here, but I think they're just to make this look nice. Uh, there, there's also a lot of information here, but you need to understand how CLDTs work and how the white jazz CLDT works. So, um, uh, yeah, so, um, but I reduced it quite a lot, especially in the recent weeks. Um, so, um, then there's additional metadata that YJS needs to handle conflict resolution. And I refer to this, it doesn't matter now, but I refer to my paper where I defined like origin and this write property, which is now write origin because I guess write was already taken. And they refer to IDs. Um, they refer to the content. Well, at the beginning, when you create this item initially, you insert it between two other items, right? And origin and write origin define where you define inserted it originally. So this is um, this is necessary for conflict resolution in order to define a unique order of the item list uh, whenever you integrate it. Yeah. So I. Send yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So so origin maps up in auto merge as far as I can tell to the predecessor property, um, and including in the order. Um, yeah. But I'm I'm curious. Uh, sorry, you got something else to say I mean, about that. I mean, predecessor is something. Um, it, it's something. I, I guess predecessor the operation that was created before that, right? In auto merge. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah, but that is different from uh, what the meaning is in YJS because it is where this item was originally inserted. So let's say I, um, let's say I, I have this code A, A, B, C, mm -hmm. and now I insert the big X between B and C. The origin would refer to the B character and the right origin would refer to the C character. Yeah, I think that's the same in, in auto merge. Oh, I'm not 100% okay. sure that it, so auto merge will both express and store like the sort of parents of like which operations came before this operation. But also, mm -hmm. whenever you do an insert, it will express the, describe the the yeah the character to the left of that character's uh, ID, um, which is the same. Okay, yeah. In auto merge, you basically just refer to the item to the left. Yeah, I think it's yeah it's to the left, and you also give some priority. For example, um, if if I did this, I refer to B, and if I want to insert another character here like the Y, I'm going to give Y the priority, I guess, too because it is, it is more important than the X, right? So you want to insert before the X. Uh, and this is um, how the RGA algorithm works. Um, in, in YJS, you refer to two um, items you want to insert in between two other items. And this is the whole idea here. Um, um, yeah, this is... Well, yeah, yeah what, why, Ola, can you, I, I'd be interested in hearing you talk a little bit about why, why it's better this way, you know, why, why this way instead of the way RGA does it. Um, so I believe that um, this is the natural way how conflict resolution uh, should work. Um, okay. This is this comes more natural to me uh, to mm -hmm. insert in between two things. Yep. And also, there are some downsides of giving this priority. So basically, the authors of RGA they said like, okay, we have this root algorithm which also refers to two or two items, one to the left and one to the right. Um, but uh, they said, okay, no, we can make it more efficient. If we can remove one integer from this thing, uh, we can remove a bit or um, bit meta information and still achieve convergence. And then they say, yeah, it's it's true. We can do that. They proved it, and it's cool. But um, it has some downsides, um, especially if if you look at the benchmarks B13. Um, uh, this is really cool. Uh, they had it coming. Um, so RGA has a big um, downside, and it is uh, right here. If, if you prepend a lot of characters. Um, so uh, the second column is auto merge, which is an RGA uh, implementation, and Delta CRDT, which is also an RGA implementation that I benchmark here. Um, and auto merge is uh, less efficient than YJS in general. Um, it is because it has more overhead. I'm sure they're gonna fix it eventually. But um, the important thing here is if you look at B12, 
uh, it is insert a string of length one. Um, they need three seconds to do that. And in order to parse it, they need 500 milliseconds. So uh, this is less than that, which is good. It's a good property. So when you load the document from, let's say, the network, um, you need less time to parse the document than apply changes to the document, which is good. This is what we want. Um, now, if we um, have the same, same thing here, um, prepend n characters um, in YJS, it's roughly, well, it's actually more, but it has, um, it is because a lot of items are created, but it's not a lot more. In auto merge, it's like, I don't know, it's like 25 times more. Um, it takes a lot more time. And the other thing is parsing this document takes the same time as a um, applying the changes. And the reason for that is that um, every time you insert an item using this priority approach, you need to um, sort the list between, um, you need to sort all the, well, items, I guess, uh, mm. according to the priority. And you need to do that with every time you apply an item to the document. Does this make sense? It does, yeah. I mean, it's, it's a very rare case that you're going to be prepending a series yeah. of characters rather than appending. Um, right, it's true. But uh, I, this is absolutely true. You're right about that. And you can optimize for that. And you can right. probably also represent your encoded format more efficiently. So for example, I think the new auto merge um, implementation, they want to um, uh, encode the document in the way that it is written. For example, mm -hmm. if you write character A, B, C, and then prepend D at the beginning, uh, you're gonna um, encode the document D, A, B, C. So in the order, in the natural order, right? Yeah. Um, which makes sense, and they should do that. Another problem of the RGA uh, implementation is, maybe not in general, maybe you can optimize for that, but um, um, so, um, if you have concurrency here, if you have um, a lot of clients doing concurrent actions, mm. um, the performance overhead is also pretty bad. You need to, let, let's go to the string, where is it? B1, uh, here, uh, this is it. Um, basically, when you encode document updates uh, and uh, when you sync document updates with a lot of peers, um, sync, uh, applying the changes takes a bit of time, which is natural because it's, that's a lot of conflict resolution happening. But every time you parse the document again, uh, you also need more time to parse that uh, document. Mm -hmm. I, I, I mean, just in co the general concept of RGA is not natural to me. And this benchmark repository, actually, I can't click on this anymore. <laughs> so this is the last thing. Uh, this is the last thing. So here's the automotive performance branch, which uses the more the uh, very efficient encoding technique by automerge. So the document sizes are comparable. And you can see in practice, even though RGA has less meta information, you can encode meta information in YGS more efficiently because on, in general, YGS uses less, has a smaller document size. Why is that? So yeah, uh, so I don't know, be, maybe because I, I don't know. Um, I think you can, uh, because the, okay, there's actually a good explanation for that. And mm. um, my, my theory is that um, there, when you insert a character in YJS, you refer to left and right, and uh, you don't have a priority, which is kind of random, or it's always zero or whatever, but, um, Instead, in YJS, you refer to the right item, which has a clock, which is in most cases the same as your own clock and the same as the clock to the uh, left. Like in really in 99% of cases, it's the same in practice also, because if you're gonna write on a paragraph, for example, mm -hmm. um, it is mostly you writing on that paragraph. And the next time you join the session, you write a different paragraph and maybe you do a few modifications on the previous paragraph. So you can um, encode the document ID more efficiently. And also the clock is, yeah, I mean, it, there are also methods to encode the clock more efficiently of the right item. Yeah, so and, and in, in practice, yeah. Yeah, I was just gonna say for what it's worth. Um, so for a bit of context, mm -hmm. 
the auto merge performance branch still hasn't been finished yet. And I we chatted to Martin about a couple of these issues. Um, mm -hmm. So auto merge does not uh, does not do the run length encoding of multiple subsequent characters that that YJS mm -hmm. does that we were talking about earlier. Um, mm -hmm. I asked him about that, and he said that he um, he thinks that like with the performance branch, because of the way it represents it, uh, it'll do the run length encoding uh, at that point anyway. So it doesn't matter if every mm -hmm. character is stored. Sorry, if every character is represented as a separate operation, because mm -hmm. the the data representation will take care of um, making that fast. Um, yeah, I'm not entirely sure I agree with him, but that's like where he's coming from with that. But like, yeah, yeah. and it's completely yeah. fair. And um, like, honestly, um, I think um, I, uh, another thing is um, I got the idea to use run length encoding. I got mm. that from the auto merge performance branch. So a big con contribution to uh, Martin uh, for the, uh, for his paper because I was like, yeah, you can use run length encoding, and I needed to play around with it. So basically, before I only used a variable length encoding, and then I used um, a, a different concept that is also using RLE encoding, different RLE encoders. I, I have a big repository full of RLE encoding techniques <laughs> that I invented just for YJS, and w which is what makes YJS uh, more performant. Um, uh, but really, um, you shouldn't care about the document size too much, even though if even if uh, an approach uses double the amount of uh, uh, double the document size. It doesn't really matter because text documents are really small in general. It it really does matter if you in in the worst like in most cases documents are smaller than 10, 10 kilobytes. Even large documents have a size smaller than one megabyte. So it doesn't really matter if you sync um, a document of a size of one megabyte or of one point five megabyte. It's if if you can apply all these operations more efficiently, which I think I can in YJS, then uh, yeah, use use more data, use more meta information. Doesn't really matter. Just don't be too excessive. Yeah. yeah. Cool. All right. Yeah. All right. <laughs> A nice nice excourse. Um, yeah. Uh, Sorry, uh, Mike. Do you have any questions on any of this? I've been sitting there very very quietly. Um, no, I'm actually, this is really interesting. I'm enjoying it and I'm going to have to go to sleep pretty soon. I am starting to fade. <laughs> yeah, um, but I'm looking forward to that. watching the rest of it later. Um, yeah, this encoding formats like pretty cool and I like all the different and, and also, uh, Seth, thanks for asking these questions, comparing it to auto merge. I think it's very interesting seeing, especially like Kevin, like seeing your mind active as you like, I can tell you've gone through the experience of trying these different things. And, um, mm -hmm. so that's, that's an experience that I've never been able to get, you know, just reading code or looking at GitHub. So it's pretty cool. Right. Right. Yeah. Cool. Cool. I, I'm really happy you're doing this because I'm basically too lazy to write uh, a, a paper or whatever about this, uh, this whole concept about all my experiences. And I, it's always fun to me to share my experience. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm happy. I'm glad that you asked me stuff to do this and uh, I'm happy to share. Okay, yeah, I'm really enjoying it. So yeah, <laughs> cool. Cool. Okay, let's, I'll just let's, say, let's continue. I'm gonna say goodbye right now because it's it's one a.m. and I really gotta sleep. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. Cool. Uh, see ya, Mike. Uh, bye. Cool. Uh, it's just us now, Seth. Mm -hmm. You wanna walk through this more? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, meta information. Um, meta information. So. We have uh, origin yeah, and yeah, and write origin. So, so, um, right. so sorry, just to, to restate what you were saying before. So, having write origin adds a bit of extra data over the wire, but it means that the priority system gets much more sim much simpler, and we get better performance um, when we're yeah. actually like uh, merging a lot of operations where there's lots of prepending going on. That's the main reason. Exactly. Um, it is easier to apply operations, and also there are some cool effects that make um, concurrency easier. Um, when you do it like this, um, mm -hmm. you can basically, there's a, there's a very efficient order in which to apply document updates or in which to integrate um, items into the documents. Even if you receive a lot of document updates from many, many peers, you can apply all these document updates in a very efficient manner, basically taking the best path, walking through the item integration process that makes it possible to, um, yeah, that, that makes YJS pretty efficient. Mm. Is, it, is it something like where you, uh, where you just walk all of the 
I mean, I assume that all of the updates are, are traversals of the document structure, and then you just walk all of the traversals at the same time. Is that the idea, or is it something else? Uh, not not sure what you mean by traverses. So, um, so if you imagine a document, if the document's just a string, a traversal would be just a walk uh -huh. the entire length of the string from start to end. Mm -hmm. But now we've got the string of the original document of the document locally, and the 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 string of well, like the the list locally and the list from a peer of the delta of the changes, and I could you know, like be like, oh, then it says like, you, you know, like only there's an insert at, at sequence number, you know, at some ID. So I keep on walking on my own until I reach that sequence number. Then I do the insert and then I walk a little bit further here and then, you know, and so on. Uh, yeah, I'm not makes, explaining I, this well. Maybe I'll let you explain it. It. <laughs> explain no, it, it, it makes a lot of sense what you said, uh, but it's not what we do in YGIS. <laughs> Great. Um, <Cool>. <laughs> no, um, I, I mean, um, I played around with a lot of integration um, approaches. Um, so basically, I also used um, this approach where you just encode the document in the order in which um, it is already integrated. Then you can just redefine that. But uh, if you do that, you need to um, add additional meta information. And also, you would have two update formats. It's, it's like this one update format that you can use to store documents and one update format that you can send to other peers in order to do conflict resolution. Mm. Um, I mean, I'm sorry, I, I guess this doesn't really make sense, but um, in YJS, there's just one way to encode document updates, and it is, we should talk about this later. It doesn't yeah. really make sense to uh, run cool. yeah, no, no, that's this fine. right now. Cool. Yeah. Um, but uh, let's definitely reiterate to, um, First, we need to know how the items are indexed. And after we know how items are indexed, we can um, go through the integration process and how we apply document updates. Cool. Um, yeah, so um, we talked about the metadata. Um, it also has a parent. We uh, referred to that before at the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, so that makes sense. Oh, so yeah. if, and so will every if, character within the string all have the same parent? Yeah, they all have the same parent. Yeah. Um, yeah, so this is basically, um, yeah, I, I guess there are different cases. Uh, so um, if it is a parent, for example, a Y text type, it is going to be um, an abstract type, but it also can be null in some cases um, when this item was deleted um, before. Um, we might go through this later. Um, and it has some content and some additional meta information. Um, deleted, we talked about this. And then there are also fast search marker, which is a new uh, concept in YJS. It's basically skip list. Um, cool. YJS uses skip list to refer to positions, but um, a very minimal um, approach. Like it's, it's not, it doesn't really index a lot of data. It just indexes a few positions. And when you want to insert something in the list, you first going to jump through the skip list and find a position and um, um, uh, use that information to insert the next character. Yeah, so my understanding, um, so the if I want to send an update to another peer, I always send the, the deleted bits. So that's going to be order n to be able to like collect all of them, right? Mm -hmm. and, and then order n in terms of memory, um, although it's going to be quite small, small constant. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, is, is finding a character inside the string, like if I, if I hit the A key on my keyboard, um, does my editor also have to like do a linear scan in the document to find the place where um, where to insert that? I mean, uh, generally yes, in most approaches yes. Uh, YJS has an optimization that is based on skip list, where um, I index a few positions. Um, basically, the, the previous well, it depends. The, let's say the previous ten positions that you use. <clears throat> And I'm going to index these positions. And whenever the document update document is updated, I'm going to update the skip list. Um, so this allows me, if you inserted something at the end of the document, and then you insert again at the end of the document, I'm going to use yeah. the item of the skip list and yeah. uh, start from there and iterate back or forth, whatever makes sense the most. So it's like you're just caching a set of the last 10 positions that have been yeah. referenced by editors? Yeah, great. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, yeah. Exactly, yeah. Um, so this worked great for me. And it's mm. also important to encode this efficiently uh, because memory is so expensive in JavaScript. Um, 
this is just a single boolean and an array of let's say 10 uh, skip list items that are associated with the position mm -hmm. um, but it needs to be marked as a fast search marker which I, which is the term i originally used um, for the skip list implementation but i guess skip list makes more sense it's a skip list with a height of one uh, if that makes yeah. sense it does make sense <laughs> yeah uh, do, do you have yeah. a, a pointer to the next item inside that skip list? Is that how it works? That's usually what you put on a um, skip list. Actually, um, it's a stupid representation. Um, <laughs> okay, it's, it's fine. It's just, Don't worry it's, it's just, it, it, it's just um, an object that defines the item and then mm -hmm. associates that with an index. Okay. And the list is not even sorted, I think. No, it's not even sorted. You just yeah, overwrite sense. items. Uh, you just ten, ten items is, is, is it doesn't matter. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't matter. I, and in practice, it makes a huge difference because yeah. when you work on a document, you probably work on the same paragraph all the time, or you jump back between a few paragraphs and I am going to index the position of these paragraph. And this yeah. is, uh, yeah. Yeah, this is how it works. Um, cool. So the integration process, it is here. So after you defined your item, um, actually, very, very, very quickly. Uh, I talked about at the beginning when I create an item, I'm going to define all these parameters, my unique ID, left, origin. Origin is going to be equal to left, right is going to be uh, equal to right origin, mm -hmm. um, if that makes sense, right? Yeah. Um, and then there is parent. I always got to define that. Parent sub is used if this is a child of a map. Uh, parent sub is going to refer to the app to the key of the map, mm -hmm. and uh, then it has some content. Is, is the right. key of the map another, like, is that more content or is that just a fixed string? It's always a string and it's always a fixed, uh, yeah, it's always okay. a string. Yeah. yeah, okay, cool. Um, currently there are no numbers supported, although it would be possible, but yeah. it doesn't really make sense right now. Yeah. Um, all right, let's continue fresh um, yeah. with, um, with the integration process. So first, uh -huh. um, we define an item and then we integrate it. Here, this is the integration process, which basically before you define where you want to insert an item and then you're going to insert into the list. And in some cases, there are conflicts. It is, um, conflicts may happen when two users do something concurrently, they insert an item at the same position at the same time. So mm -hmm. there's going to be a conflict and this co whole contract resolution algorithm is this. This is everything that is needed for contract resolution. It's basically just uh, 20 lines of code. Um, and before that, even like in the paper, it was just, I think, seven lines of code. It's really okay. simple. Um, this is an optimized version that applies document updates in O of C and where C is the amount of concurrent operations at the same position. Cool. Um, yeah, so it, now it uses sets instead of um, instead of iterating back and forth, and it's generally pretty efficient. And the cool thing here is it has a break condition too. Actually, um, a break condition is cool because you basically basically iterate over all the conflicting marker conflicting items, and at some point the algorithm will just say, "Okay, break here," because I'm sure you got to insert the item at this position. Mm -hmm. um, whereas if you iterate through the whole conflict set, um, at some point uh, you will always iterate through all conflicts, which um, will increase your runtime a lot, which is why YJS works pretty efficiently, even if there are a lot of concurrent operations. So, um, so uh, does it just, so I, I mean, I'm still thinking in RGA terms, but I'm imagining we have mm -hmm. uh, one character and then we have say like three, three concurrent in inserts right after that character. So three inserts mm -hmm. that have that that named character as the origin. So um, so I have the first character that gets in, that I, I find out about, and I insert it directly afterwards. Then I find out about mm -hmm. the next character, and then I I I find the origin. I find the conflicting character, and then I decide to put it to the left or the right. Mm -hmm. And and then I get the yeah, third exactly. one right. And now I have to scan through to find the right location, which is what this loop's doing, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You basically so, um, iterate. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So. Uh, it, let's say the first character comes in and then I get a hundred more characters after that character. 
Do I have to scan mm -hmm. past all of those characters to be able to find the next character that has the same origin? Yeah, uh, this is exactly, yeah, this is um, exactly not the case in YJS. You don't always have to sc scan through all the conflicting items, through all these. Um, oh, conflicts. yeah, yeah. So, sorry, uh, let me rephrase. So, um, uh, so let's say we've got two concurrent updates, right? The first uh -huh. concurrent update that I find out about doesn't just insert one character, it inserts a thousand characters at this location, right? Mm -hmm. so then the next concurrent update to the same location comes in that should appear after these thousand characters that appeared. Mm -hmm. Is this going to um, like scan through the thousand characters to find the point after all of them? I mean, there are two cases, right? If, if the thousand characters are part of a single item, you will def you will ah. just iterate to the item, right? Right, right, Which and is, almost all of the time they will be, so. Yes, I mean, concurrency yeah. is so rare, but um, now since YJS uses this compound representation to represent a lot of characters as a single item, it is basically impossible that you do more than one, um, you have more than one conflict or more than two conflicts, because mm -hmm. what is the chance that two users insert at the same position at the same time. It's impossible. And um, so, um, I mean, it's, it's very rare. It's not impossible. And no, we I... handle that and test for that. But, you know, it's very, very rare. And even if that happens, and this can happen, for example, in the map type, where it's natural to insert at the same position, uh, then there can be a lot of uh, conflicts. And, uh, but um, because there's a breaking condition, um, it will break uh, very soon or as soon as possible. So as soon as you find the correct position, it will break. Well, yeah, in most cases it will. In, in a few cases it does not. Um, and the break condition is related to, um, well, it's basically related to the client ID, uh, which is why I, um, why I apply updates from users with a high client ID first, and then hmm. the smaller cli client ID uh, last, because right, right. the smaller client ID will be inserted to the left. So yep. um, you basically right. get this break condition pretty soon, which is really cool. That is very cool. Yeah, um, just to support what you're saying about there not being many uh, concurrent updates. Um, I worked at, uh, at Lover, which is a, um, American startup uh, in San Francisco um, for a couple of years. This is a number of years ago. And this is when we developed ShadyB. Um, and they're still using it to power the whole application. So that's like all built on top of real time uh, OT, like JSON over OT, um, mm -hmm. operational transform. And so the whole the whole UI is live. Uh, there's a running joke internally that we were joked that we spent, <laughs> we spent like, you know, like a year of our lives making two screens look exactly the same as one another. That was <laughs> Um, nice. <laughs> but but at one point, uh, this is recently early on. We had about a thousand concurrent, a thousand users um, uh, mm -hmm. within any given day. And at that point, and our users were like, you know, like they're like uh, hiring managers. So they would have often they'd have like five or six tabs of our application open, just in different tabs, looking mm -hmm. at different people and things that were going on. Um, and at that point, we had about three three <laughs> three concurrent edits a day. That was the number for mm -hmm. so all of this work. And, wow. You know, and that wasn't <laughs> even like concurrent edits you know, at the same location in a document that was the same document being edited by two users at the same time. Um, right, exactly. Very, very rare. Yeah. yeah. So, right. yeah, I mean, I think it's more common for, for text documents, um, obviously, but yeah, for regular JSON documents, it was, you know, it's like any, any work done to optimize the transformation function is pointless, um, pretty much. <laughs> yeah, you're right. And you've been, like, you've been talking about this a lot on Hacker News and, and stuff, and you're really right about this. Uh, there's a lot a lot of people talk about CRDTs being faster than operational transformation, which I don't think is the case. Mm, uh, yeah. Because CRDTs in general can handle conflicts better than OT, but um, the conflicts happen so rarely uh, that it doesn't really matter. Yeah, yeah. Although I think that, like, I think the difference between, um, I mean, like, you can see this in the auto image performance branch. Like, the difference between a good CRDT implementation and a bad CRDT implementation, even with the same algorithm, can be like, you know, a factor of like a hundred or something or a thousand in some cases. Right. And, you know, so like, uh, yeah, I think, I think in the ideal case, operational transform, right? Like a perfectly implemented operational transform algorithm should be marginally faster than a perfectly implemented CRDT using modern CRDTs. Mm -hmm. But like, 
you know, but I think that the actual differences in practice are going to be blown out of the water by like uh, by language choice and actual algorithm implementation that, you know, I, yeah, like, um, yeah, yeah, I mean, That's yeah, cool. as an example, like I, you know, I think I mentioned this the other day, I made a simple proof of concept implementation of, um, of some of the RGA stuff that Martin did, um, just mm -hmm. to see how fast it could uh, handle inserts, right? No concurrency, no nothing, only inserts mm -hmm. all I implemented. And I made a B3 implementation in Rust and it could handle 6 million a second, right? And like, mm -hmm. You know, like the, the fastest operational transform algorithm I've managed to make in JavaScript it is on the order of um, uh, like 400,000 a second, you know, last time I benchmarked it. So like, huh. you know, and that's just like, um, that was doing string insert. Oh, sorry, that was doing string inserts with a beach, with a skip list implementation in JavaScript, um, mm -hmm. which was faster than the raw string implementation after strings got to a certain point. Um, but yeah, it was, it was only doing, it was a few, yeah, it was a few hundred thousand inserts a second into a skip list in JavaScript. and much faster in Rust, even with all of the extra right. work that the CIDG had to do, because yeah, because Rust. Had yeah, to of work. course, well, and, and it makes sense that CIDGs are more expensive because mm -hmm. I mean there is a lot more meta information, and there is additional complexity. But the the advantage, of course, is that it works well in the peer to peer manner. Um, with this, yeah. this is the whole idea, right? And once you define that correctly and everything works, it, I mean in practice. It, it doesn't really matter, even for huge documents. Um, it doesn't really matter if you have a parse, if, if it takes like 20 milliseconds to um, apply updates or if it takes zero milliseconds because the user won't notice. And um, the network delay is probably much worse um, if you depend on a central server. Right. If yeah. you can scale yeah. properly, you have a lot more advantages, which is, yeah. I guess, what made you interested in CDTs. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm interested because of what you can do algorithmically, like in terms of doing the peer-to-peer -peer stuff. Um, right. Uh, yeah. I mean, like, I, this is this is like some CIDT theory and OT theory. Uh, well, first of all, like, if two users assist, like, I type the A character and it appears instantly on my computer. Any system, it doesn't matter because it's local, right? Right. Now, if there's a right. 20 millisecond delay between when I hit an A character and when you're sitting at a desk over, notice the A character appear. Neither of us can tell, you know. So that right. doesn't matter. So it doesn't matter if like if your computer's a long way away. So long as we're using OTLC or RDTs or something that let me apply the change immediately to my local model of what the document is. Um, and so mm -hmm. long as that local application is very fast. So right. um, which some CRDTs aren't or haven't been historically. You know, for example, if you had to actually scan, if you had a like a 10 megabyte document and had to scan the entire document, um, like do 10 million iterations to find the insert location anytime I type something, it's probably gonna be right. like typing lag, which is not okay. Right. So, yeah. yeah. I mean, so that's, even that's then, that. I guess if you have 10 million characters, it's going to be slow. But if you have a million characters, it takes like five milliseconds to scan to all those characters in JavaScript. Yeah, 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 so. yeah, I, absolutely. I mean, even, even with all the OT stuff that I've done, like the most common usage is I've made a little simple, um, tiny, very terrible diffing algorithm, which specifically works on text areas inside JavaScript. So that if I type mm -hmm. any character, I just run this function. It grabs the string from the current context grabs the string from the last content and then just tries to chop off as many characters from the start and end as it can. And then says right. anything that's left over gets deleted and inserted. That's the, the algorithm. And right. doing that in every keystroke, oh, it's, it's fine. Like it's very fast because most, most right. text areas, most of the time you've got a very small document, you know, and no one notices. Right. Um, yeah. Uh, that's, that's so true. I guess the, uh, the main advantage of OT um, over CRDT is that you can do something like that. It has a more, Right. It has an operational approach, right? You can uh, transform an existing document and when you sync with another client or when you sync with the server, in this case, mm. um, you're just going to receive the whole text document. You don't care about the meta information. Yeah, 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 exactly. And there's no need to send any meta information, which up, up until like, up until the work that Martin's been doing has been like hundreds of megabytes for, for CIDTs. And it's like, oh, I, I can't use this, you know? And like, you know, all the run length encoding stuff, if, if it's, if it's like an extra like 5%, that's fine, send it. If it's like an extra like 5,000%, right. like no, <laughs> you don't need the T. Right, um, I mean, uh, I mean, run length encoding makes it possible to encode a document roughly in the size of the original document in YJS as a 1.5 uh, overhead. So it's 50% larger than the original document. And it's a similar to the performance branch in auto merge. But before that, I used just binary encoding for documents. 
And because um, items are efficiently represented in YJS and I use variable length encoding for all integers, it was also pretty performant. It was um, 2.5 times the original size. Yeah, so, okay. um, it, it's, so it's, it, it, yeah, I mean, it's not so bad. And as I said, it doesn't really matter, uh, which is why the old encoding format is still supported because it's much simpler. But uh, yeah, it, yeah. Um, I, I guess I, these are the big, it was, it's good that we went through all of this. Good that we have the same opinion there. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I mean, and, and for what it's worth, like OT can be much less efficient than that. <laughs> and often is because a lot of the time people will end up storing all of the operations going back through history. So the nice right. thing is that you don't like, they're very rarely accessed, but the downside is that usually you end up just having a big list. So every single operation that's ever been applied is in this big list in a database or wherever it's stored. Right. And like, um, there were some people that were using uh, ShadyB and did some benchmarking. So they set it up with, I, can't remember, I think it was Visual Studio, not VS Code at the time. Mm -hmm. So they could do a collaborative editing um, work uh, and they did some pair programming. And, you know, like for a couple, like they wrote, you know, a thousand lines together or something, but ended up with something like, um, it was like a hundred thousand edits, I think, or like 200,000 edits, mm -hmm. something around that order, like between the, the two users that were doing pair programming. And, um, and that ended up uh, taking a lot of space just for the operations. Because um, we, we mm -hmm. you know, ShedJS and ShedEV doesn't do any run length encoding or any special fa fancy binary format. It's literally just storing right. all this JSON. So, yeah. Right. But by the way, I love the uh, I love that you still have a FAQ uh, FAQ, which basically just tells you that no, you can't delete the operations from the database. <laughs> uh, I, I I always love that, and yeah. It, also, it really makes sense because if you want to support like offline editing, like if you want to support syncing documents that are weeks old, uh, mm. you need to store the operations even in, auto in um, operation transformation. But the advantage, of course, is that you can just uh, you just store them once and probably never need to access them. And it's the same for CLDTs. You need to store the whole operation log. The, the advantage is that you can encode that pretty efficiently. Um, in, in YJS uh, or in like in CRDTs, you can encode that pretty efficiently. Um, yeah, but you should also be able to trim with the CRDT. Like if, if you took YJS or auto merge, um, like for any deleted character, um, like it, if I want to do a trade, I should be able to do a trade off of saying, right, um, I don't want, I, I don't want to, I'm not going to allow or be able to understand any operations that were produced more than a week ago, right, from, from the live version. And in exchange, what I could do is I could take all of the deleted characters. And I could just run length encode them all together and say they've all got client ID zero or sequence number zero or something, right? So you, yeah. you can't have an operation that comes after one of them, right? And unless mm -hmm. they're explicitly named, right? Maybe you, you have special case for, for characters that do exist in the yeah. document. Uh, but this yeah. is this is true. Uh, and I talked about this in my in my original paper from 2016, mm -hmm. uh, that you can do garbage collection on the tombstones, but only okay. under the circumstance that you can make sure that all clients synced within a certain time frame. So yeah. what you can do then is if you have a central server, um, um, even, even in a peer-to-peer -peer manner, but if in most cases you still have some kind of central source, um, you can uh, basically once a week go through all the old operations and garbage collect them. Yeah. And this is also possible in, in CRDTs, but um, I don't really recommend it anymore because it's so error prone um, to implement yeah. that. And, and also practice, like, yeah, I was chatting to PVH, who's one of the guys who wrote the, uh, at Ink and Switch, the um, local first paper. And he was like, uh -huh. these things have very low bit rate. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it doesn't matter. <laughs> like it can be inefficient. Right. Like my fingers just don't produce many bits per second. So, you know, it can be yeah, very exactly. inefficient and it's fine. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah it's, it's, it's so hard to generate a document in a CRDT that really is hard to pass or, and I showed this also in this, uh, in this blog post, right? Mm. In order to create a marginally large document where you need like two seconds to parse the document, you would need to type effectively for two years, uh, nonstop <laughs> with uh, 30 characters per second. Mm. Um, and this doesn't even account for changing the position because if you don't change the position, this would be encoded really efficiently. So, um, um, yeah, you yeah. basically need to type with 60 uh, characters per second for two years to generate a large document. In yeah, uh, even even with ShedJS and ShedDB, like, uh, mm. 
I, I think so we talked about making an optimization for this and we just never got around to it because it never mattered but like oh, i think shared right. did this optimization shared never adds this optimization it doesn't matter which is that um if i make one change a single character i type in a character that changes the server the server will load the mm -hmm. entire document from the database will apply that one mm -hmm. character change to its local model then recommit the entire document back to the database and then tell you that you've done it and then do that with every keystroke and it's like well, that's awful. There's so much extra round trip. Like there's all sorts of optimization. Yeah, you could like yeah. cache it locally and then do like, you know, like there's lots of stuff that you could do to make that more efficient. And we're like, yeah, yeah. we'll, we'll do that later. And then we never got to it because it never mattered. Like, yeah. Oh yeah. I, I, so. yeah, I guess the string transformations are pretty cheap and, uh, I, you're right about that. There's so much stuff that is more important. Yeah. Uh, but by the way, I loved one of the, um, the things that you did in operation tra uh, operation transformation and that is that you can um, merge operations with each other oh yeah, uh, yeah i composed. think that was a pretty neat oper uh, pretty neat idea and um i partially adapted this approach for this compound representation so if you type mm -hmm. abc it's basically merged into a single item right and this is the same with your operational um, um encoding approach so you can merge Changes yeah, together. I, I'd love to take credit for that. Um, I think so. We did that on the Google Wave team as well. Uh, huh. So Google, Google Wave does that, and and the reason why is because, um, uh, well, the way that the team thinks about thought about it at the time is that uh, I've got my local computer and I make a bunch of changes, and um, if I if I have very slow network, so I've got one second latency and I'm typing very fast, then if I have to send like n n operations those n operations have to be transformed by like k other operations from other users, which is like an n mm -hmm. squared, like m times k, you know, work. Instead, mm -hmm. locally, what Google Wave does, which simplifies a lot of things, um, as soon as there's one operation in flight to the server, every other change is composed on the local machine. So like composed into a bigger mm -hmm. and bigger operation. As soon as we get confirmation of that operation back, I send the big composed operation to the server. And then I, then I start afresh on my local client. So there's only ever one okay. operation in flight to the server from each client at a time. And that dramatically lowers the number of concurrent, um, uh, like, trans yeah, um, yeah, it means you don't end up with like a, a, a list of operations versus a list of operations, and you get better like asymptotic complexity, um, even though you yeah. increase the the end to end latency between users. So, yeah, yeah, that's sorry, that's probably more information than you're interested in, but that's where that came from. No, that's uh, that makes a lot of sense in the OT context. I was, I thought you just did it in order to improve. Uh, performance when you merge stuff mm. uh, when you do transformations because when you yeah. transform an operation uh, with a length of 10 characters it's the same uh, if this operation has a length of 20 characters um, right yeah yeah although weirdly so this is like very surprising there are some cases I can't remember any of them off the top of my head um, you can't do it in the transform case in a lot of situations it turns out that sometimes uh, and I, I don't, I can't remember if this applies to text. It might only apply to the JSON type, but, um, the situations where transforming by operation A, then transforming by B, then transforming by C will give you a different result from composing A, B, and C together to get one operation, then transforming by it all in, all in one go. Huh. Interesting. Okay. I get, yeah. I mean, this field is so magical. Um, there are a lot of weird things that can happen and, um, yeah. So I implemented both an operation transformation approach that works peer to peer and a CRDT later on. And, um, oh man, this, the stuff that you learn and how you experiment with the stuff. Um, I really recommend it to anyone. It's so fun to work in this space. Yeah, me too. Right. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, oh yeah. The other thing I was going to say is that I think I, I don't, I think most people don't notice this, but I feel like there's a there's a pair between CRDTs and OT. So like, mm -hmm. like we were talking earlier about how it's like we've got if you've got on the OT world we've got a document and then we've got the entire list operation history, right? Mm -hmm. And then I can do transformation to take an operation at this point and then transform it up to the most recent point and apply it in place. Um, you can think about all the metadata that's stored in in line in a CRDT as the equivalent of the operation log, but stored mm -hmm. in a more efficient representation, and then mm -hmm. The transform operation um, is the equivalent of looking up a location inside a document. And anyway, mm -hmm. I, I think they're more or less equivalent algorithmically, except where CRDTs give you better runtime performance um, mm -hmm. because you can you can 
yeah, you can do some tricks to be able to find a location and document more efficiently um, yeah. than you would need to do by through transform. Like transform can't preserve some information. Uh, mm -hmm. but, yeah, anyway. <laughs> yeah, um, you're, you're right about that. I, I can absolutely confirm that. So the initial implementation of um, YJS, um, mm -hmm. when I did my bachelor thesis, it was based on operational transformation because I like this approach that you can um, transform an existing thing instead mm -hmm. of constructing something as you do with uh, CRDTs with OT, you can transform anything, right? Uh, it's just an, a way to represent changes. And I like that. Um, but um, so the thing is, if you use index positions, um, so my experience is that um, since index transformations, uh, they always are concurrent to other things. So in YJS, something is only concurrent when you insert at the same position at the same time between the same characters, right? right. In operate, operational transformation, anything is concurrent, uh, yeah. which makes it more, uh, more uh, well, complex if you want to do it in a peer-to-peer -peer manner, which is why you need to define a lot of additional metadata. So um, I use something like a state vector, basically a vector mm -hmm. of all the clients that joined, and I defined the state that I know of, of all these clients. So when I receive an operation, um, I would transform my document back to the state of that operation and then transform this accessing operation through this, through this tree. And um, I guess this makes sense. You can do that, but it's so complex. It's so, it's, it's so mind blowing to me. And also each operation needs to have the state vector. It didn't make sense at the time. Yeah. Um, it, it's also very inefficient. Guess, like once you start yeah. having a lot of operations, it's very slow. Uh, yeah. Right, I, I implemented exactly. that too. And like, yeah, it's the, um, it was um, Tobin Weiss. Uh, he made a, a, an implementation of OT called Lightwave back in 2002, 2001. Mm -hmm. uh, he's a German, German researcher. I can't remember which university he was at. And um, yeah, he talked about adding, adding the prune function. So like you've got transform and then add prune and prune is the inverse of transform. So it untransforms mm -hmm. an operation. And then, uh, which sounds similar to your, your approach. Um, yeah, right. not identical, but yeah. Uh, but actually like finding like, creating that linearization of all the operations is, yeah, a lot of work uh, in metadata, a lot of work computationally and so on. Yeah. Right. And uh, if you do that, you still need to um, store all the operations that are ever created, as you do with ShareJS, ShareDB. Um, you still need to do that in OT, and the same is true for CRDTs. So I thought, OK, now let's, uh, let's use CRDTs instead. Um, yeah. Actually, like at the time when I wrote, I, I was I'm a bad researcher, I guess. I only researched OT. And mm -hmm. then at the end of my thesis, I was like, oh, there's this thing called CRDTs. And um, I mean, yeah, I should have looked into it more, but at the time it was not that popular. So um, I kind of dismissed it. And I came out with this, I thought it was novel. And then uh, I guess it's not that novel. I, I, I thought I, I adapted this approach using um, uh, with the information that I got from the Wood paper and all the other papers that um, came later after that. Um, so I basically um, distinguished myself, like my findings from the Wood paper. And I think still that the Yata approach is, um, there are similarities because they both use like two um, references to, uh, uh, to refer to a position in a document. Uh, the transformation approach is different, and I really like my visual representation of conflicts, uh, mm. which I use all the time to understand how conflicts work and uh, in order to make sure that it really converges. But yeah, this, this yeah. is a bit of the backstory. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Although I think that the, um, the resulting document order is still identical in, in um, Yata and in RGA. Well, at least like, sorry, maybe not RGA, but like auto merges, I understand. I haven't read the RGA paper. Um, I'm also a terrible researcher. Uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, like the way that, as far as I can tell, the the final document order for a bunch of inserted characters. Mm -hmm. So like, auto merge also uses, as I said, the client ID and sequence number idea, uh, client mm -hmm. ID and uh, um, and clock, uh, as you put it in here. Right. Um, uh, mm -hmm. And yeah, I think that the the way that like, so auto merge thinks of it as a tree of um, uh, a tree of characters, like a DAG, where every character has a parent, which is the, the character to the left. Um, and mm -hmm. then um, then the whole thing is linearized where if there's ever a fork in the DAG, then you have to do the priority stuff that we were talking about earlier. But 
I right. think anyway, I think that ends up equivalent to your um your like you know origin origins never allowed to cross property. Uh, um, I I don't think you're right. Uh, I, I mean you're right in most cases. Actually, yeah, in most cases you will end up with the same document order. You're right about mm -hmm. that. But as soon as there are uh, three users involved, you can define conflicts that work differently in both approaches. Because then, because yeah, because the clock, uh, the client ID is not enough to resolve conflicts between three users. Mm -hmm. uh, well, it is in a simple scenario. If three users insert an item at the same position, you would just order by client ID. Mm -hmm. But if you, for example, user A, B, three, and user A knows about the operation from user B, um, but user C does not know about the operation from user B. So um, there's this weird mismatch um, of, there are many different orders in which you can apply or, um, operations or mm. uh, items, structs, whatever. And it's the same for um, operational transformation. Just um, in a, if you wanted to work in a peer-to-peer -peer manner, the client ID is not enough to make it work in a peer-to-peer uh, -peer manner. Well, okay. unless you use GoTo, I think. I think it works in the go-to approach. I'm not really sure, but uh, like this is my general understanding. Um, it's definitely true for CRDTs. Yeah, cool. Um, yeah, anyway, I, <laughs> I, I'd be curious <laughs> to see an example. I, sh I, I should stop getting distracted and distracting you. Uh, <laughs> yeah, um, no, um, we could talk about this for, for days, I think. Absolutely, um, but maybe yeah. Ma yeah. maybe we should uh, continue with uh, with a lot of uh, with a bit of this <laughs> stuff, and well, um, so we get to an end at some point. <laughs> yeah, um, it's always uh, already getting dark for you. So um, yeah, mm. let's 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 um, finish up the integration process, mm. um, and then maybe talk about how how items are indexed. So um, yeah. yeah. Uh, just to recap, so we talked about how you create an item in order to represent a change. Mm -hmm. uh, you insert, you want to insert an item between two other items or between two other characters. Mm -hmm. And um, then you call the integration process, which basically uh, does that. It finds conflicts and resolves conflicts and finds a unique position for your item to integrate into. And then actually does the integration like it resets the left and right so it is integrated into the list and it is now generally available to the user to well um, to see this item and um, that's a cool thing like you said in in most cases there's not really a conflict happening and this is what this if is about so um you could remove this if um because then you would just have no conflict markers but um i recently implemented this if which basically asks, are there any conflicts or is it just the correct position? Right. And uh, then you just integrate it right away without um, creating additional meta, uh, well, without iterating through anything or and without creating sets and all that stuff. Yeah. And in most cases, like in, actually in, in all cases, I, it's very rarely that there's a conflict. If there's a conflict, this part is called but if not, we're just gonna jump into um, well into this process here, okay. and then um, we add it to the database to the struct store. Um, so basically, the store um, is an index over all created items that are ever created. Uh, we also integrate the content. Some cases this might be necessary. For example, if it is an as a type. And then there's also a transaction. Uh, I want to like talk just a, a bit about transactions, why transactions are there and why transactions are cool and necessary. And then uh, we can talk about indexing. Yeah, great. Um, um, yeah, so uh, everything, any kind of change to the document structure in YJS needs to happen within a transaction. Um, where it is? It is. Um, all right. Um, a transaction first is created, and then you define basically the state of the current document. And then after the transaction is executed, you have a new state that you also define. 
Um, so it can basically compute the differences between two states. And this is really um, important for the event system to work correctly and um, also to clean up um, all the changes that we did. For example, if we split an item into two items or if we deleted something or like there are a lot of cases that can happen, um, we need to clean up the whole document structure. For example, we need to merge documents. Uh, the, we need to merge items with each other, with neighboring items, um, which is like part of the reason what makes YJS uh, performant, uh, that it merge items with neighboring uh, things. And all of this happens within a transaction. So you create a transaction and um, basically call uh, this transaction function. Um, uh, first, you execute a trans. Yeah, this is a cleanup. This always happens after any change that happens. And this is a lot of complicated stuff happening here. We don't need to go over this. Um, I think it's generally useful. It generates updates. Um, it uh, calls a few events. Um, it's not really important, but um, you need to know that there is a transaction. Any kind of change that happens um, is within a transaction. Mm -hmm. um, now, I guess we can go yeah. into... Why, why does that need to be so complicated in the cleanup? Like Oh yeah, uh, I guess because there are a lot of things that can happen. Like, um, for example, if I insert an item somewhere at the end of a document, for example, I could check right away if I can merge this item with the previous item, right? For example, mm -hmm. if I type AB, the yep. next thing is I type C, I mm -hmm. can merge ABC into a single item. Mm -hmm. But what happens if in the same transaction, I delete the character B, then I can't no longer merge this item. So basically, I postpone all this cleanup to a later point in time. Do you, um, do you actually do you actually modify or like do you hold on modifying the structure itself until the transaction completes? Or do you modify no, it's, immediately? It's and direct, then... It is immediately modified, but you can still revert back in theory. Okay. Because um, I mean, you know about the document state and the deletes before the transaction. Mm -hmm. um, I stored that uh, here. Basically, you store the current delete set, you compute that. Uh, no, no, no. Um, you complete all, you store all the deleted items within this transaction. Right. So basically, right. when I delete an item, I store the ID and the length of that item here. Mm -hmm. um, delete set is this efficient representation of deletes. And every transaction carries a delete set. So if you want to undelete, if you want to revert a transaction, you can just undelete the items if you don't want to execute this transaction. And there's a before state, basically, um, for um, for every user. Now, uh, the the IDs. Um, let's recap the IDs. It has a user ID and a clock. So when when um, I create new operation when I create new items, they have a bigger clock, right? The next mm -hmm. clock I'm going to create is clock plus one. Yep. Um, so um, I store clock for each user ID in this before state. You can see it's a, it's a map from number to number. Mm -hmm. So I know the state before a transaction. And um, so if I want to revert, revert a transaction, I can just um, iterate through all created operation uh, items and just delete them and deintegrate them if I want to. But yep. um, we never do that. It's currently not supported, but I think it's, a, it's an interesting idea to support this type of um, transaction. So you can just cancel a transaction and everything is reverted. But yeah, at the end of a transaction, um, here, at, a, at the end of a transaction, um, there's a, the event handlers are called. Before the cleanup ha happens, actually, I don't know where the transaction is here. Transact. Yeah. This is this, basically, you always start a transact with mm -hmm. um, where you create a transaction, and transactions can be nested, and it's really complicated stuff, but um, you can see. Um, uh, where's the actually call? Where's F called? Here. Uh, we call F. These are some changes that happen within a transaction. And then we call the event listeners. Uh, we can compute the differences between the changes that happen. And then we clean up everything. Uh, this is basically what happens within a transaction. 
uh, you can go through this and you will probably understand what happens. Mm -hmm. um, there are a lot of references, a lot of uh, stuff going on here. Basically, most of the part is um, calling the observers, which is what I call the event system in YGS. Mm -hmm. um, there are different kinds of observers and different ways to compute the differences between changes. And then you merge, uh, then you try to garbage collect stuff, uh, which is something I do. For example, if you, have, if you have a type and you delete that type, you can garbage collect all children because you are no longer interested in the order of the children, right? Um, right, so yeah. This, yeah. This this is um, something I do if garbage collection is enabled, and which is what garbage collection collection is now in YJS. It's a safe approach for garbage collection if you choose to use it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, sorry. Um, sorry, my brain blanked out for a moment there. So if you garbage collect no. and you've got a big deleted region, so then you can, I guess you can like reorder all of those objects inside the deleted region to make it so you can sort them more efficiently, like. Uh, no, you can't do that. I mean, I guess there's an approach where you can do that, yeah. but um, if if you delete an, just a single character or a range yeah. of characters, you're going to go to the, um, I, I guess this is uh, yeah, go to the something items and then... important. You're going to go to the item, uh, mark it as deleted, and another thing that you do if garbage collection is enabled, you replace content. Yeah, um, yeah that makes So sense. assuming you have a length of 10,000 characters, you can now just completely delete content because yeah, you are cool. not no longer interested. But yeah, you yeah, are yeah. interested in the length of content because you yeah. still need a reference. There was once content here. Right? Yeah, but it's different for it's different for um, for um, a parent that is deleted because if a parent, for example, a white text type, if it is deleted, you are no longer interested in this text type. You can garbage collect all the children. Mm -hmm. And that means you transform all children to a GC struct, which is here, uh, which is basically just also an abstract struct. Uh, this is everything. It's an ID and a length because that's mm -hmm. everything you need to do from now on. Uh, you just need a marker that this garbage collection struct was once present at this um, disposition. Um, yeah, what is so this is important. What's the length useful? Length. Um, you know that content has length and mm -hmm. IDs refer to content and not to, uh, not to items. IDs refer so, to content, not to items. Yeah. Think yeah. about this. Yes. Um, an item has, yeah, just, but uh, quick recap, uh, an item refers to characters ABC. If mm -hmm. you want to refer to the second character, uh, you would refer to the second character as ID um, dot client comma ID dot clock plus one, right? Mm -hmm. Because yep. it's a second item, you need to yep. increase this uh, ID thing. Mm -hmm. So uh, the same is true for um, garbage collection structs. Um, you need to know what, how, many, how much content was once present here. You are no longer interested in the actual content, but you want to know that there was once content. So you need right, to be right. able so to- Right, like, right. Yeah, so like clock from clock, clock 100 to 200. Um, Exactly. You know, yeah, it's all contained within this deleted region. Yeah, cool. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And GC structs can also be merged, and they can always be mm -hmm. merged. If if I have two GC structs, um, uh, one GC struct just deletes uh, with clock of zero, and it deletes mm -hmm. one character, and mm -hmm. uh, another GC struct with clock one, and it deletes ten characters. I'm going to merge these GC things into one but, GC with a length of eleven. But only if they're from the same client ID, right? Exactly. Yeah. 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 Cool, but great. in general, like in general, um, there are just very few GC structs available because you usually delete a range of content. And yeah. I mean, there are different things that play a role here. But in general, it's 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 a thing that yeah. you want to do. Does the GC so. generally make it faster? Like I imagine that all this extra work of actually converting everything across to GC or to GC structs and stuff would, you know, like. Would slow things down. Oh, could slow things down because of the extra actual JavaScript garbage collector. Um, I mean, you do create additional objects. Um, mm. So, so what happens is, um, okay, let me think about it. Is it faster? Is it slow? So, um, if you have each item, um, and if you garbage collect an item, you call this GC function. Um, 
there's there's a trees garbage collection thingy there's merge delete gc yeah mm -hmm. um so you basically call this and this tells the content okay first delete the content there are some things that happen here and then you replace this item with a gc mm -hmm. and so yes it is additional overhead but you only do it once right right uh, so so you just once uh, transform it and then you merge all the gc structs in the transaction at yep. the end of the transaction yeah and uh generally this makes it faster because from now on you have less items to worry about and the garbage collector can do it there it's so confusing that there's a yjs garbage collector and there's a javascript garbage collector yeah but, yeah uh, I, yes. I guess i yeah I, I could imagine i don't know if this is actually the case but in a lot of situations the benefit of having GC structs instead of like text structs or whatever being quite marginal. And in those cases, mm -hmm. the the work of doing this replace struct might end up being more work in total than just like ignoring it, you know, and like leaving it all there yeah. and deleted. But yeah. Yeah. I and also like this GC thing, uh this GC approach, it's completely optional. Yeah. Um you can just disable GC and you will do that if you are interested in the history of the document which is yeah. something I want to advertise more because in general, it's pretty useful to have the whole history encoded efficiently as a CRDT model. So you can always revert back to any point in time, which is so cool. Um, but yeah, I, this is what, uh, but in some cases you don't and I, I want to have good benchmark results, which is what this is about. Speaking of which, so something that auto merge does is um, every operation uh, also stores a timestamp of when that operation was made. Um, mm -hmm. Is there anything like that here, or, or you do not do that? No, I don't, okay. uh, because cool. I th to me it wouldn't be useful uh, because yeah, I yeah, have a visual sense. representation of the CRDT model, which is much cooler. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I guess I'm just I, imagining if I wanted to have a slider that would go back and forward in time, then. I'd need ah. to be able to compare two operations in chronologically to be able to do that, to find out whether or not yes. one operation from one client was instead of for another one. Yeah. YGS has a different concept for that. Um, it's called state vectors. Um, a state vector, uh, we shortly went through this in the, in the transaction thing, but we can go through state vector too. Um, here it is. All right. Ah, why can't I go in this encode state vector? All right, here it is in encoding. What is that? Where is it? I'm sorry. Um, I think it's pretty cool. Um, yeah, so this is, it's a binary encoding of the Lamport timestamp, right? Like the, the vector plot. Not just the Lamport, it's the uh, Lamport timestamp of all the clients, basically. Yeah. Um, um, Wait. Wait. Yeah. So yeah, you, it's, it's like a map from client ID to, to clock pairs, right? Exactly. Yeah. This is uh, what the state vector is about. Mm -hmm. And um, then there are also snapshots. Snapshots are basically um, uh, state vectors with the um, delete set um, in addition. So um, using the delete set and the state vector, you can revert to any point in time. So um, if you want to have a slider revert back and forth, I mean, yeah, you would have, you, you would need to store all the state vectors ever, but um, there's another thing. Um, um, I mean, it has other advantages to encode um, the uh, snapshot in the way I do using the delete set. Um, generally, you don't want to have a slider. You want to have fixed snapshots and you want to do snapshots. Um, for example, um, before you sync to another client, you could create a snapshot. And when you synced with that client, you receive a bunch of updates, you create another snapshot. And now you can compare the differences that happened within these snapshots by calculating the differences between the delete sets yep. and also the differences between the state vectors. And right. this allows you to efficiently um, create a visualization of what happens um, in the past. And I just, I think it's so cool. Um, most yeah. people hate it, this, this <laughs> website, right? Um, I mean, it's, 
I know it's awful and I, I, I played with a lot of CSS tricks, but this is basically what happens here. I can create a new uh, version. So this is a snapshot. And then I click on this version and I can see everything that happens. Uh, well, there, nothing happened here, but uh, here. Um, so some rem remote user inserted this content, deleted that mm -hmm. and removed that. So um, uh, in this case, there's only a local and a remote user, but mm -hmm. um, um, the reason for that is there are a lot of users joining this session, but you can also associate usernames to the changes that happen using state vectors. There's a lot of calculations that make it easier if you use, um, if you use uh, this representation of changes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, interestingly, the time slider. Um, I, I agree. With you. We added it in the Google Wave, and it took a very long uh -huh. time to load because it would send all of the historical operations to the client when you click that button, which was mm -hmm. slow for reasons because it's all in Google Web Toolkit. Anyway, people almost never clicked on it. Like we we spent Fine. a lot of effort to make it. Some a lot of people would click on it once and be like, "Oh, that's cute," and then just never go back. Uh, that was it. Exactly. Yeah, it's the same for Pirate Pad. I think they also had it, and I love this feature. But the thing is, who would ever do that? I mean, why would you interest <laughs> it? Uh, uh, just imagine this. Um, we both work offline mm. and then sync our changes. And now yeah. the time slider is related to time. That doesn't make sense. Why would it be related to time? Yeah. It should just sync the, the diff it should show the differences to my current state of the document to what right. you ever created, right? You yep. want to have git blame. You don't want to have this uh, time slide. I mean, that's my opinion. I guess the time slide yeah, yeah. is still cool, but I'm I'm defending myself from not. No, no, I, I hear. I, I think you're probably right. Like, I, and I, I use git diff all the time, like it, for code. Right. You know, like what's the difference between right. this version and this other version, this other commit? Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's 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 really useful. Um, yeah. yeah. The cool cool thing is it also allows you to do that in a peer to peer manner. So <laughs> these versions only exist for me. So um, I store the state vector here. Um, if you visit this website, you will have different versions that are related to your edit history. So are those state vectors stored in local storage? Is that what's going on here? Like on the website? Uh, in IndexedDB, but yeah. Okay, it's, yeah, It's cool. basically local, yeah. Um, this is what's going on here. And this is completely peer-to-peer -peer, and you can also go offline uh, visit this. So this is just uh, one of the use cases. Um, mm but this website is no longer really maintained. There's a different documentation website now. I, you know how it is. I, I know exactly you how it is, some, I'm with you. Yeah. yeah, you invest some time, think it's so cool. I invest so much time just on this, uh, I guess, on this thingy, on this animation, because I thought it was <laughs> cool. And, and the cool thing is, I don't use JavaScript to do the animation or this at all. Uh, is it all CSS? It's all CSS. It's so cool. I'm so interested in doing <laughs> applications without JavaScript, though I'm a huge fan of JavaScript, but I think That's, it's so cool. That is really cool. That's really pretty. I like it. <laughs> funny. Okay. Um, um, yeah, okay, cool. So, so we've talked about transactions. We talked about uh, encoding state vectors and how they work. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. I'd be interested. Uh, I mean, no. I feel like we've been talking about a lot of things. I, I'd be curious to see briefly some of the network protocol or like, how that works, but yeah. I think you've also got some other things that you want to talk about. Oh, you want to talk about the um, the, the the struct store, right? The struct store, and then we, I think, then we covered all the preliminaries. Preliminaries. Preliminary. Or, um, yeah, yeah it's it's a hard word. It is. Um, then we covered everything that we need to know mm -hmm. um, okay. uh, about YJS. I, I think this is the the last thing that is really cool. I already added a comment here. Um, um, okay, so um, actually let's uh, keep it deleted. So the, stru the struct store, uh, this is how it works basically. Assuming um, you have this client ID, I have this client ID. Mm -hmm. Whenever I create an item and integrate it somewhere in the list, I'm gonna append it to this list. And you can see in this, uh, in this example, um, I, uh, the first item is always zero. Mm -hmm. And in this case, this thingy is deleted. The first item here is deleted. Mm -hmm. um, the next one is clock one, and the next one is clock three. 
um, how can this happen? Why is this clock three? Because this one has a length of uh, of two, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So basically, this is an ordered list of items of thing of items that I created, and this mm -hmm. is an ordered list of items that you created. Um, yeah. So um, it's just an uh, it's just a list, and we always append to this list, which is everything we do. And I don't use binary trees to index this data. I just do binary search. So I see I start in the middle and mm -hmm. then check the clock. Uh, so if, for so, example, so, if I search. Okay. Yeah, so, so when are you looking, what's an example of when you might want to be looking up some operations or some, um, some items in this list? Yeah. So uh, when I receive an item uh, from another user, so I received your, your item. And mm -hmm. in this case, it might be item. I'm just going to copy this one. Um, yeah. I think it makes sense to just represent it here. Um, yeah. the, the clock ID will be five because clock one plus four is five. Mm -hmm. um, and you also, uh, you want to insert it between character, I don't know, between this item and this item. You're going to refer to the lamp or timestamp, to the ID, unique ID of the item, right? Mm -hmm. and before I can integrate this item into my document, I need to find the items that you are refer referring to uh, using binary search. Um, so you refer to this ID. Mm -hmm. I'm going to find it using binary search on this array. And right. then I can set it as the left property of this item. This is basically what happens. Right, right. So you could use this. Um, so, so if I, if, if I, I insert a character and I tell you about my inserted character, um, mm. then you don't scan the entire document looking for the character inside the link no. list. You use this, you do a yeah. binary search, and then you can jump straight. That, that's like a, um, yeah, exactly, like yeah. a intrusive collection. So you can jump straight to the item itself. Yeah, that makes sense. Exactly, yeah. Cool. Um, so basically, two ways to find an item. Um, mm -hmm. The one is to go to the type and then iterate through the content of the type and then find an item uh, or the position that you're interested in. Um, in this case, it's almost always an index position that you want to calculate using the type information and iterating through the list mm -hmm. or using the um, skip list implementation, uh, which is an optimization on that. Or you want to refer to, an, um, to, to content. You want to insert between some content properties, right? And then you're going to use the lamp or timestamp or the ID to refer to content. And yeah. uh, this is what you send to other clients. You send mm -hmm. the lamp or timestamp, and then you calculate uh, the actual item reference and store that in the item. So it's a linked list. Right. So, and, so if uh, I, mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, so like, ahead. I was going to ask, so let's say um, I'm, I connect to you over the network and I find out that, you know, you are behind, you, you need, there's five more operations that you don't know about from, mm -hmm. from, from me. So would I go to this list and then just like slice the part of the list and encode that and send exactly. it to you? Exactly. Yes. Right. That's that's cool, right? So um, yeah. assuming like um, I know about um, this ID, so I know about mm -hmm. client clock one, um, but I don't know about client clock two mm -hmm. because it is encoded within this one. I would first split this item into two different items. Yep. Then grab this list of items, just just like this, like the split mm -hmm. item and uh, all the remainers, like everything that comes after that, mm -hmm. encode that using binary encoding. Uh, for now, you can just think about binary encoding as uh, encoding all these integers using variable length integer uh, encoding. Mm -hmm. And then you send it to the other client and the client will decode it and well, apply it locally, just append it and uh, integrate it. That's yeah. everything that's happening. Great. So, um, yeah, this is this is. Um, it, it took me some time to realize that an array might be one of the better ways to implement um, the struct store. Mm -hmm. uh, yesterday, um, uh, you said, "Yeah, I, I guess it would make more sense if auto merge would use B trees." Uh, you are right; it makes more sense. But you know what's even better? Arrays and binary <laughs> search. Yeah. Um, I I guess, yeah, that, that comment for what it's worth. I'm imagining, like, if I were to implement all of this, 
I think I would, mm -hmm. so you've got the two implement, sorry, the two data structures, you've got the list and then you've got the, mm -hmm. uh, sorry, you've got the array here in the struct store and then you've got mm -hmm. the linked list of the characters. So mm -hmm. when you're, so when you're getting a, um, uh, uh, like an ID to, to find out, to, to do an insert at an ID or something, you use mm -hmm. the array, you look up the item and then you, then that jumps you straight into the point in the linked list right, very fast. Mm -hmm. um, but when you're going the other way, if I've got a location in the document, so I want to insert a position a thousand in a text document, then to find position mm -hmm. a thousand, I have to scan like unless it's in the uh, the cached set, um, mm -hmm. I have to scan a thousand characters in the linked list to find it, right? Yeah, I guess in the in the worst case, you got to scan a thousand characters. Yeah. The skip list is always useful, even if the skip list contains a reference to a thousand fifty. You're gonna start at thousand fifty and iterate back, right? <laughs> right. Okay. So yeah, that makes sense. Uh, you're yeah. only gonna um, go usually to the pretty subset fast of that. It's yeah, that makes sense. Pretty... What I was imagining is if I if I implemented this myself, if I wanted to be really fast. Mm -hmm. Although I'm not sure. Like talking to you, I, I realize this might not even be a necessary optimization. But keep the array part. I think that's great. And then over here, mm -hmm. have a binary tree of of the items, and then do all of the encoding that you're already doing. But that would let you. Um, uh, that would let you do a couple of things. So one is if I've got, uh, if I want to, um, yeah, if if I've got some location, I can use, I can traverse the binary tree to find that location. Um, mm -hmm. If I do an insert, I would just, so like every every internal node inside the binary search tree would store the length of all of the children. Mm -hmm. So an, an update would need to update all of the parents. So it's like a login update. But um, yeah, but then if I want to, I want to do insert at location a thousand. I can find location a thousand in login time. Then that gets me the item, and then I can talk about it to create the operation. And going the other way, you could have the array just reference directly into the children of the binary search tree. Uh, sorry, of the B tree, and that would be fast as well. Anyway, that's that's what I was imagining. Um, but yeah. Wait, wait. You want to represent instead of having a linked list, you want to use a B tree, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, yeah. A B tree Cause it doesn't it. allow you to refer to index positions in lock in. Uh, yes, it does. If you've got, if you have a, um, uh, if you have all of the internal nodes store the number of, store the length of the children, you, it does. Because like. Okay, fair enough. Yeah, because at, at the root, I'm yes, like, okay, the first item, I can see that that has length of a thousand mm -hmm. and the next item has length of like 10,000. And I want to find mm -hmm. item 1500. So I go like, oh, skip the first one, go to the next one. Okay, it's down in there. And I split that out and then I can I can just walk it down. Yeah, you're right about that. Uh, you can do that. Um, it requires additional properties on the items. Um, you can just use the item as the, well, let's say the items of the B tree, right? Mm -hmm. um, yes, you're right. And there are some problems, I think. Someone uh, implemented something like that and basically it was too complicated to me, and um, I I said, uh, nah, let's not use that. It, it's it's weird. Um, I like the skip list approach better because, like in most cases, it's really it's really better. It's not a skip list. What you've done, you you've got a cache of some locations. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, you're right. It's a, it's a cache. I was thinking about um, transforming it to some better skip list approach, but I got the idea from skip list. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I mean, I've, I've made it. Yeah. I, I can show yeah. you actually, I made a skip list in Rust, sorry. I made a skip list in JavaScript because I thought it was a really cool data structure. And then I ported yeah. it to Rust and, and it's like a rope. So it's like a like a string where you can insert an arbitrary locations in the string for, for this kind of thing. Uh -huh. um, and uh, um, sorry, I'm just thinking, I'm trying to remember the, the URL. Um, uh, and, uh, and I did that using skip lists. And then, but there's also some very good B tree implementations which do the same thing in Rust. Yeah. And I was curious right. about how they, uh, how the pull Performance compared. Um, mm. So, uh, sorry, I'm just gonna. Oh, actually, no, I'm still screen sharing. I'm gonna you send you a share? link. No, okay. I'll just. Do you wanna? Okay. I don't know how it might mess up the recording. Um, I just sent you a link in chat. <laughs> if you just click on that link. Okay. Uh, in the WhatsApp chat, right? Uh, sorry, in the Zoom chat. Oh, okay. Uh, no, it's really hard to find the <laughs> okay. chat when you. Send it in WhatsApp. Screen. I can send it. Or I can just, I'll just share screen. I'll, I'll do it here. Um, okay, okay, let's do that. I think that's uh, easier. That might be simple, yeah. So, uh, I feel like people watching this, it's gonna be a bit all over the place with the two of us. Um, 
<laughs> okay. <laughs> anyway, this is um so so this is just some um uh, using Criterion RS, which is a really great um benchmarking framework inside in Rust. So mm -hmm. I grabbed a bunch of different. This is I, I mean I made this a, about a year ago, so this benchmark might be out of date, but. I grabbed um, mm -hmm. uh, XIRP, which is the, the C editor. I don't know how it's pronounced, um, which is a CIDT editor. Um, jump rope is my Rust implementation of a skip list. And um, it's interesting. So this is, um, this is uh, yeah, so this is insert delete. So um, we made the character, we made a string. We made, yeah, we made a document be a million characters long. And then we mm -hmm. iterated through inserting and deleting. So insert delete, insert delete at random locations in the document. Mm -hmm. um, and you can see that the you know it's like linear time, so it um, it, mm -hmm. it stays the same speed no matter how much we do it. But you can see this um you know this is just the amount of time it took to do uh yeah I think it was one one insert and delete pair. Um, I have to look mm -hmm. up the test to remember. Um, but in comparison, if we look at um, something like XIRO with the same data structure, um, you can see that. Uh, Oh yeah, sorry. In in this case, my implementation was faster. So um, yeah. Uh, Wait, yours was faster? I thought my the other list was one... faster. No, oh sorry, the the scale is different. Oh, so this is in microseconds, and and this is in nanoseconds. So the mean oh, for mine okay. is four hundred and about. Well, actually, we can see it. The mean is four hundred and sixty nanoseconds, and for XI, the mean is seven hundred nanoseconds. Mm -hmm. So, so in this case, so, my skip list. Um. What makes your skip list different? It's, well, I guess... this is this is a B tree, and this okay. is a skip list. Oh, so the different data structures, which both have log n time, okay. but they yeah. but log n on one is different from log n on the other. Um, yeah. But anyway, there, there's a bunch of this is like such a tangent. There's a bunch of interesting properties of this though. So the sample time, it not actually go, or like it, it it gets faster, weirdly. Like it's slow at first in the in the B tree, oh. and then it it improves. Um, which is really strange. Uh, so maybe if we look at the like the ten megabyte document size ones, this is at ten megs, and let's pull up mine okay. at ten megs. Um, compare. Um, there we go. Oh yeah. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. We'll zoom window. Getting away. Um, so if we compare these. Um, yeah, so now the performance is very similar. So at, at 10 megs, wow. the B tree starts to catch up. So we're looking at 900 oh. nanoseconds to do an insert delete in my skip list. Mm -hmm. And, um, and oh, actually, wait. Sorry, is it, it's a thousand microseconds per nanosecond, right? Oh, actually, sorry. No, mine's, mine's 10 times faster. Sorry, my bad. Yeah, um, I, I, just, I, yeah. I was just looking at the average time, and the one yeah. says 10 millisecond nanoseconds. Yeah, 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 on one. average, yeah. and the other one like one microsecond. So uh, skip list seems to be much faster, right? It, it is much faster in this test. I, sorry, I think I did a couple of the tests and found some different results. But um, okay. sorry, I found situations where it was pretty neck and neck. But the the thing I found the most interesting um, is the sorry the, the data I'm actually showing. It's been too long since I've looked at this data. Um, something I found. Sorry, maybe it might have been one of these other other tests. Um, uh, yeah, some of the skip list, sorry, some of the rope implementations in Rust are much lower quality than others. So you can see here, this is a um, inserting at a random location in a document of the same size. I can't remember what the size of the document was. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you can see the XI rope and mine on and this document size are very similar. Um, mm -hmm. This N rope implementation is very bad. Uh, and then this is this is inserting just like splicing into a string and doing doing mem copies. Um, Interesting. Yeah. It's it's uh, actually not that bad. <laughs> yeah. Well, this might not have been a big enough document to be able to tell the difference. Um, okay. Like for it to really take your know, um, scale. Yeah. You can see here inserting into a raw string that you can see the uh, okay. yeah the quadratic performance. Um, but but um, until a certain point, it is uh, actually better than the other implementations. Yeah. Mem copy is very fast. <laughs> Everyone forgets how fast <laughs> mem copy is. Mem copy is ridiculously yeah, right. fast. Um, but absolutely true. Um, but anyway, but um, uh, yeah, one of the properties uh, again, I don't think this is the a test that can see it easily, but um, but often the B tree implementations have a lower standard deviation, so a skip list will be more spread out because there's more the randomness ends up resulting in a larger variance at runtime. 
Um, mind mm -hmm. you, in all of these tests, like none of this is is enough to be able to tell. Um, yeah. Uh, oh yeah, this this is one in which my jump rope, my skip list implementation was much faster than XI rope, which is just purely inserting. Mm -hmm. So this just inserted, I think, a hundred thousand characters individually into random locations. Oh, sorry, inserted mm -hmm. into the end of the document um, versus inserting a random location. But oh. yeah. Um, and in this case, yeah. So the raw string is having to reallocate with every insert, I think. Um, yeah. Anyway. I mean, it's 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 really hard to test, um, yeah, performance, right? If you just think about random insertions, mm. which is basically what all the CRDT papers do. Yeah, I mean, we test right. performance by doing random insertions on a document, um, but this is not really what happens in practice. In practice, yeah. you probably same position. So maybe a cache, and this was my reasoning, a, a cache might be better suited for text mm -hmm. editing. Um, because you, if I cache um, a certain paragraph, for example, mm -hmm. uh, you will probably work on that paragraph and on a few others, but ignore yeah. most of the rest of the document. So mm -hmm. this was my reasoning for the cache implementation. No, I think it's great. I mean, I, I wanted to, so I, I don't know if you've seen this. This is uh, Martin's auto merge performance. Um, yeah, I know of it. Yeah, well, anyway, I, I really like his approach with this benchmark because, and you might have done something similar in your benchmark, so be curious to know. Um, he actually just like, they wrote, a, he collaboratively wrote a paper together with one of his, you know, colleagues, and then they're yeah. in their own little hand-baked editor, and then they use that as the benchmark to be able to compare yeah. different uh, performance. Um, so yeah, uh, I think it's great. He shared his uh, results. And I use that also as a basis for co um, collaborative edit, uh, as, as a benchmark. Uh, in the CRDT benchmarks repository. Oh, cool. Um, yeah. Yeah, you, you can go to it, just search for CRDT benchmarks. And um, I compare different approaches. Uh, not not righteous, it's under oh. Demonet, a CRDT benchmark. You can also just Google it. Okay, and then, yeah, it's already there. Yeah. And the B4 test. So the idea here is you have a lot of different cases. Ah, um, great. Yeah. The B1, yeah. Uh, it is basically the same thing. Uh, the mm. idea is that you have a bit different cases, like what happens if you have no conflicts, if you have mm. two users producing conflicts, which is basically a client server model. Yeah. Um, or if you have like an uh, end to end model where there are lots of users producing conflicts. And the B4 are real world uh, scenarios for producing conflict for, for editing, right? And this basically confirms my expectations that uh, first, that um, when you create changes, this merge um, approach that YJS uses, this compound representation, really um, has an advantage over representing every single character as a single thing. Yeah. And um, also the search, the, the caching approach here, um, mm. it's pretty efficient because you can apply the whole data set in five seconds. Um, by the way, this is, um, this is improved. Uh, this has more complexity if you scroll to the above results and um, there this this table is inserted twice um, <laughs> okay once yeah so basically oh, yeah, yeah. um i mean automerge doesn't have the best performance at the moment uh mm. even the performance branch is pretty um slow so yep. there's basically this table and there's another table uh cool. which is um which Awful. is a bit more complex so yeah um 20, 20, while, sorry. wait is that 200 the uh, 20,000 seconds it's a lot it's it's like eight hours or something. Oh, <laughs> uh, this is uh, the PSCRDTs. Um, auto merge okay. takes uh, five hundred milliseconds, which is oh, five hundred seconds. Uh, five hundred thousand uh, milliseconds. Yeah. That's like five hundred seconds. That's still awful. This is uh, yeah. Um, I mean, I so they basically. Um, yeah, they have not a linked list. They dive. Uh, go through the graph or I think through the mm -hmm. JSON model, it's, there's a quite a lot of overhead there because YJS doesn't really have any overhead um, in, well, I don't need to transform it to a JSON object or anything. I can yeah. just work, work on the CRDT model and use the caching approach. Mm -hmm. I can apply all the changes in five seconds, like the yeah. no benchmarks are in five seconds. This one is a bit slower, um, mm -hmm. which is fine. I think if you can apply, I think this was, uh, 250,000 operations in five seconds. Um, that's like less than a millisecond per operation. 250,000 operations in five seconds. 
yeah yeah i mean that yeah that that's fine <laughs> sorry the, uh, it's, it's fine i don't say it's perfect but there's a lot of yeah. other overhead right um it's not just searching in these positions it's also creating objects and sending these objects to the other peer and you yeah. know there's a lot of overhead and no yeah one of no, it, sounds, it sounds about right thinking yeah. about your implementation um, and i don't think that this uh, this fast search marker approach uh, or the skip list approach that i implemented is perfect um, mm. it's just pretty good at the moment it does the job um, I like that it doesn't really have any significant overhead in any case. It's just yeah. an improvement, right? Uh, which is what I was going for. Maybe in the future, um, a Rust implementation definitely should use B-Tree or your skip list, actually. Uh, I think that sounds good. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so that's, that, that skip be... list is just purely for strings. Um... Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, but but still, like maybe a similar probabilistic approach that you use, I guess yeah. that is uh, what distinguishes your approach from others. Um, but I think for text CRDTs or any other thing, um, uh, it is different than a random um, searcher, right? If, right. Yeah. Because in in text editing, you don't insert at random positions all the time. You insert yeah. at the same position basically all the time. So this is why a caching approach is appropriate in this scenario. Um, and in most cases, right, it's it's less than a nanosecond to find an uh, an a list an item in a list. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So this is what I was going for. And yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, sorry. One other question, like just to bring things mm -hmm. back a little bit. I've just been holding on to this. So, um, so when you sync with another peer, you can just slice the array to find the um all of the different um struct stores to find the operations mm -hmm. you need to send um do you but you also have to always send the the deleted set is that right at the beginning yes um when i sync with you as a peer i'm going to send you all my deleted operations mm -hmm. um or all my deleted items the references to that and yeah this is what happens it's not significant overhead um uh this is ha this happens in encoding.js as well i think uh maybe we can write update no oh no this is uh this is lib0 this is a different project um right where do i use this one I always forget the names of the methods. Um, yeah, I, I like how much you've used a lot of doc comments and all of this to make it easier to bounce around. Right. Um, yeah, it, it mostly wrote this for me. Um, yeah. They're not really for the average user. I guess once you um, once you talk to me, a lot of the comments may make sense, but especially in the integration process, you will see me just writing a bunch of weird characters. Um, uh, yeah, I, this, I have I, this, I have the same commenting yeah. style. It's like anything for me. If anything outside the function it can be read by someone who's considering using the function, anything inside is all <laughs> implementation detail, and it <laughs> doesn't have to make sense to anybody except for me. <laughs> right, okay. right. I yeah. at least there is something, and it's important to remember what happened, what you thought when you wrote this function, right? Yeah. And um, it's always good to come back and all right, this is what I was thinking. Uh, now we can adapt it or whatever. Um, I always yeah. do like notes, um, like note exclamation mark. Uh, if you can't do that, remember that. Don't never do that. <laughs> um, so this is something I like to do. Um, yeah. So this is basically where the update messages are constructed. Mm -hmm. um, every update, so an update message either results uh, from the whole YJS document at the beginning when I sync with you. I'm going to send you my whole, not, I'm not always going to send you the whole state. Um, um, so each transaction creates an update message. Uh, mm -hmm. This is what happens here. I'm going to, I have this delete set on the transaction, which mm -hmm. refers to all the deleted items. Like it ha it's an optimized representation of that. Yep. Then it does some additional optimizations. Um, so I'm basically sorting it and merging it um, with well, optimizing the set representation. Yeah. And then I write first the structs, all the mm -hmm. structs that were created during this mm -hmm. transaction. Mm -hmm. And then I write the uh, delete set 
um, in an optimized manner. Uh, yeah, this is cool. what this is about. Right, right. Okay. Um, so to, to run it through, if, if, if I connect in the first case, I connect to you and I don't have any data, so I need to get all of the data. So you send me all of the mm -hmm. deletes and you send me all of the, well, I mean, yeah, I guess you could either, yeah, I, I guess it would be equivalent to send the, the linked list in order or send the, all of the lists of structs um, in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, and then the after, then later, sorry. So, but you would need to resend all the deletes if I went offline and then reconnected. And so like when I reconnect, yep. Now I'm ahead of you, so you need to resend all the deletes because you don't know what I know about in terms yeah. of deletes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the synchronization um, basically happens in two steps. Mm -hmm. um, there's like sync, sync step. This is like from the whole beginning of the project. I call it sync step one and sync step two. Um, these happens uh, asynchronously. So first, I'm in the sync step one step. I'm going to send you my state vector. Um, and the delete set, now I'm going to send you first my state vector, which defines what I know about, all the items that I know about, right? All the clocks. I'm going to send this to you. And when you receive my sync step one, you're going to reply with uh, sync step two. And sync step two um, is the delete set, um, as I did before here. And, uh, and it's um, all the missing items that I don't know about. This is also written in the sync step two. And once right. I know about the deletes, all the deletes that ever happened, and about all the items that are missing, I, mm. we are synced, right? Mm. Uh, or yeah. I am synced with you, you are not synced with me. But Sorry, so, so another weakness of this model, you, you never know, like if we were replaying history, mm. you don't, do you know what's been deleted? Um, like if I had a snapshot in mean? time, right? So mm -hmm. like, there was some snapshot in time. And then since then, I've deleted a bunch of characters. Mm -hmm. Can you figure out those characters weren't deleted when that, like? Yeah, because the snapshot, the, snapshot also con the snapshot also contains the uh, uh, delete set. Right, OK, right. Right, so ah, there's, okay. the, there's, so just, there are two the things. Vector. There's the state, yeah. yeah, it's the state vector is mm. uh, just a reference to the clocks of all the mm -hmm. clients. And the snapshot is a state vector plus the delete set of that moment in time. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I, so to me, it seems like it seems like it would be more efficient if you. Oh, sorry, not more efficient. It seems like it would be cleaner. I, obviously, you don't agree with this, but um, yeah. like I'm imagining, uh, just like whenever you delete content, just giving that a sequence number as well, like giving that a a clock, and then mm -hmm. instead of having deleted true, be like deleted at time and then with number and then that would let you reconstruct yeah. oh and then you could also append deleted items into the the struct list which i guess is how auto merge works which would then mean that you mm -hmm. wouldn't need to treat the deleted set differently but i suppose it doesn't really matter like um yeah. i i think it does matter um in in a bunch of different ways uh that like seriously i also didn't expect that beforehand when i wrote this implementation mm -hmm. but um at some point because i implemented this merge approach to really very early on, mm -hmm. um, um, you want to represent, you want to merge as much as possible, mm -hmm. but you can't always merge deletions with each other. And here's an example. Um, just um, let's assume that um, I have like A, B, C. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now you are going to delete um, C, and I'm going to delete A. Mm -hmm. And another user is going to be delete uh, B. Yep. In my world, I can represent all these deletions as a single item, whereas mm -hmm. in your scenario, you would have three different operations, three different structs yep. that represent all these things. And you can't even merge deletions with each other. Um, uh, what you happens... can't merge deletions from different users with it. Sorry. Uh, yeah, uh, from different yeah. users. Yeah. Yeah. If but I select a whole document you know and I hit delete, then it'll end up being the same item groupings as I got for the insults in the first place. Um, yeah, but uh, they would yeah. refer to a lot of different IDs, right? If I do this, right, I select a mm. bunch of text that was mm -hmm. created in very in a lot of sessions. Like I yeah. had a lot of work in this one, and I'm yeah, going to delete bet. this. Uh -huh. um, I'm going to refer to like a bunch of items. So your deletion operation would be pretty large. Whereas in my model, in most cases, really, I can represent any deletions, any, like even if I um, 
delete the whole document, mm. I can uh, represent that uh, with um, with uh, in the number of um, users that are collaborated in this document. Because I'm basically just deleting all the items that were created by all the users ever in this document. So I select everything, delete. I created, deleted all the items. And if I have, uh, let's say, like, we have this user, uh, there are some items here, and I have this user, there are some items, right? I ju would just mark everything as deleted. And mm. um, I can represent this delete operation really efficiently. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. In in just two items, in just two operations. Right, right. Because the two uses, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, well, you could do the same thing, surely, right? Like, that's just an encoding of describing a set of operations that were deleted. Maybe it, it's more complicated, though, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, my, my, uh, the the thing is like you can delete uh, you can represent delete sets so efficiently that it doesn't matter yeah and an advantage is that you can um, encode the history of a document much easier if you do uh, use this approach um, also you can okay imagine this um, I wanna a, a snapshot is just mm -hmm. a view on a document right um, a snapshot is the state vector so all the items that I know about Yep. and the delete set. Yep. Okay, now I can just iterate through this linear, through the sequence list, uh, through the link, uh, link list of items mm -hmm. and ignore all the items that were not present at that point mm -hmm. and undelete the items of that are referred in this, that are not referred in this um, uh, delete set from my snapshot. Mm -hmm. Yep. Right, I can just iterate through this list. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this is a really cool property, and just in 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 most cases, you want to have a view on the previous state of the document. But what happens if we encode uh, deletions as part of well, as part of the document in the struct store? First, we would need to have more objects in memory to represent deletions because they yeah. are now part of the array structure in the struct store. And another thing is. How do you figure, you would need to compute all the deleted items beforehand. So you would need to iterate through all the um, deletions anyway. Uh, and to me, it, it's, it's really weird. I don't think so. So like if, if it worked that way, right? So we've got these two stores, we've got the struct store and we've got the mm -hmm. linked list. So, I'm, mm -hmm. so I mean, I'm just like making this up as I go, right? So in the link, in yeah. the struct store, we add extra items for all the deletions. So whenever I delete something, mm -hmm. I append. And then in the link list, instead of marking deleted true, I instead say deleted at and then an ID. So the ID at which that thing was deleted or, or null if it wasn't deleted, right? So, mm -hmm. so there are extra operations. But if I want to revert to a particular point in time, now I only need the state vector. And what I do is I can iterate through the document in the link list. Anything mm -hmm. that is has been uh, anything that was created before, sorry, created after the, the point in time does not mm -hmm. exist at that point in time yet. So that gets removed. Anything that was uh, created and then deleted after the point in time gets undeleted, and then you're done. Yeah, but then you need to specifically go through the items and undelete them. And once you are done viewing on that document, you need to delete them again, right? Wait, don't you have to do the same thing? No, I don't. I, for me, it's just a view. I iterate the linked list, and I ignore I, I ignore the items that are not present in the snapshot, uh -huh. and I. Oh well, if you want to make a view, it's the same thing, right? Like I, I could make a view and just ignore all of the items that aren't present. Yeah, but you would, re you would need to recreate the list in order to do that, because you would need to undo all the deletions. Need to undo all of the deletions. Uh, I think isn't it the same? No, it's not. It's not. So, um, okay, I, I think uh, you have to undo I, all the deletions too. Like no, I I I mean, um, for me, it's a view because um, instead, you know, an item uh, usually has a deleted property, mm -hmm. so like this. So I can just usually I just um, look at this. Okay, oh, this item is deleted. I'm gonna ignore it when I'm gonna mm -hmm. build the string, right? Yeah. But for a view, I'm not ignore this property and just instead look at the delete set. Right, yeah. 
right? Yeah. Because I can now do the um, delete set. Um, I basically do a uh, yeah. get item ID, and yeah. I kind of find out if this item was deleted or not. Yeah, yeah. So the difference would be that instead of so in those cases, um, mm -hmm. instead of looking oh actually like for every character yeah instead of uh, every item instead of looking at the deleted set, I mm -hmm. in, I instead oh and I guess you only need to look that up when an item is has the deleted flag set as well, um, right? Um, yeah. So so the difference is that instead of having instead of doing that, um, you would instead uh, for every item. Um, uh, yeah, every, sorry, yeah, again, every item that's being deleted. So you've got two fields, you've got like the ID of the thing, and then you've got the mm -hmm. deleted at right ID, which mm -hmm. is optional. So it can be none or it can be an ID. So then mm -hmm. you're, if the item has been deleted, right, um, there's three cases. So either the vector, the vector clock, um, like the timestamp is before the item was created, then we ignore it. Mm -hmm. The timestamp is between when the item was created and when it was deleted, or the deleted thing is none. In which case that character gets in included in this in the view, or the timestamp is after the point at which it was deleted. In which case it again does not get included in the view. Okay. That's it. So basically, it's defined deleted by as um, as, an, as ID. an ID, right? Yeah, that's yeah. right. But it it would need to be a set of IDs because deletions can happen concurrently. Um, yes, sure. Well, well said. Right. Yep. Um, and which is, by the way, another advantage of my approach because I recognize the fact that you basically always toggle deletion to true, mm -hmm. right? You never toggle back. You, yep. you shouldn't be able to do that anyway. So um, basically, um, this is the advantage. I can represent concurrent deletes uh, more mm -hmm. efficient by merging the deletions. Mm -hmm. And also, um, if I delete the whole document, it's it's just like a very small delete operation, whereas um, if I you would use um, this delete yeah. operation, like I would have a set for every item, and I would add an ID deleted by this operation. I would add that to all the items in the document. Yeah, I yeah I agree. Is, the the deleted operation itself would be larger. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I think that the, but the benefit is that you every time you sync, you don't have to. I, I don't know. I, there's a part of me that just like balks yeah. the idea of having this linearly yeah, increasing know, know, size deleted set. It's, it's counterintuitive. And, yeah. But I mean, once you understand how things are represented, and um, yeah, you should make is you should represent everything as minimal as possible in a CRDT mm. because everything is expensive. So yeah. um, if you can encode deletions efficiently, do that, and you can encode them very efficiently not as part of the document model. Um, so this is my reasoning here. Yes, you can do that as operations, but um, you also have to recognize the fact that deletions can happen concurrently, um, but there's not really concurrency in deleting something. Yeah. Uh, why yeah, would you make that of part of, yeah, it's just a set yeah. of things that are deleted. Yeah, I, and um, I guess another, another um, performance speed up, if you ever wanted to make it in YJS, if this matters, which might not matter, is, um, is say like, Periodically, I don't know what frequency you could take a cache, like a, a snapshot of the deleted set. And then if mm -hmm. later you connected to a client that um, had uh, only needed to be brought up in time from a more recent point in time than that snapshot, you would only have to send them the diff of the snapshot of deleted state you took and current, which would be smaller. Yeah, you could do that and now remember why you didn't implement all those optimizations in ShareJS. Um, <laughs> exactly. It's, yeah, it's, that's right. Yeah, it's not worth the effort. I uh, totally because, agree. <laughs> I, I mean, because syncing between clients, it's mm. already really efficient. It really takes like calculating the differences or reading the delete set or applying the delete set is so efficient that it doesn't matter. And how big are the deletes? Advantage. Like for, like if you took a like if, like how big does the delete set end up being? Like if you say. I, I don't know. I'm curious for like that um, that paper that Martin wrote, um, mm -hmm. or something. Like, I don't know if you know the numbers off the top of your head, but like, how how big does it end up being? I don't know. Um, um, so one of the things is um, um, here. Can I can I do that? Um, so 
I guess I can't, no. Uh, so I can uh, measure the size of um, the delete set. Maybe um, after this meeting, I'm gonna calculate that um, yeah. for well, this real world scenario. It makes sense, I think. Yeah, or, or the size of the of a snapshot, right? Uh, sorry, a uh, um, state vector. Uh, sorry, a state vector? Yeah, no, snapshot, I think is what I'm looking yeah. for. Right, because because then that would be comparable and for something like auto merge that used delete operations, it, it, that would be smaller, but yeah, yeah. So it'd be interesting to see how much more, like rather than just being like the number and then zero. Like, so, do you want to do it right now or do you want me <laughs> you to want do to. it later? <laughs> I'm um, not fussed either way. I am always a fan of live coding examples because they always work out. Yeah, um, me too. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I okay, see, okay, I see okay. your, so, your testing code looks about as clean as mine. Uh, <laughs> this is benchmarks, they don't matter. <laughs> I, I totally agree. I, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, um, this grew dynamically, right? I always added stuff, I never refactored, which is uh -huh. like, I, I should refactor this benchmarks repository, but I did not because time is limited and we are okay. humans, unfortunately. You're you um, monster. How do you? I can't believe the state of this code. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so um, something you're going to do is we're going to go to the um, to this one. What's this? Ah, okay, okay. CRDT benchmark. Now we can just. I still got the OT code. Do I have a change here? Yeah, yeah. Check out master still. Um, okay. Um, something going to. This is the B4 benchmarks. Maybe it's mm -hmm. it's fun to look over this. Um, so basically, this happens in. We don't want to do that. We want to do this one. Apply mm -hmm. with the real world editing data set. We apply all the changes here, and then at the end, we are gonna check if, like, assert if the expected outcome is what we expect, right? Mm -hmm. um, so something we can do is uh, we can do um, we can create a snapshot mm -hmm. um, of doc one. Did I do? No, I need to have the delete set before I um, right. You know what the worst part is? I don't remember the name of the function that I wrote. I'm it's, honestly surprised that you're not using uh, TypeScript for all of this. I like, kind of am. I, I know you kind of yeah. are. You're already doing all of the work. Like you just don't get any <laughs> of the benefit. That's why I'm surprised. Right. Um, I do get all of the benefits of TypeScript without using TypeScript, which which is um, the coolest thing I I, could, I think. So um, this is a snapshot. Um, you don't. Because the benefits are type checked. It is type checked. What are you talking about? Do you don't you notice how what is, this? Ex what uh, what why is not? type checking any of this for you? Wait. wait okay. Um, that's Sorry, let me, let me finish. We can talk about that in a minute. I'll stop okay, no, no, no. I got to put this right here. Create a snapshot, I think. If I put doc1 here, and I just did, it is underlined red, right? Mm -hmm. So it means it's type checked because doc1, it's a Y doc, and it is it should not be put in. This expects two parameters. So it is type checked, right? Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, I, I think it must be using the... <laughs> so, Looks like it's I, using the type use, compiler to type check. I uh, do, and um, I use JS doc comments to uh, write type declarations. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know. Um, I use different type checkers in my um, in the past, and for YJS, I thought like I started with JS doc, and I'm going to stay with JS doc because JS docs are so old, and they're going to be supported, and they are supported by all the editors, by all the IDEs. I don't know. They are enough for me. And yeah, that's the, right. type, TypeScript supports um, JS doc comments. They are not as cool as TypeScript declarations uh, because in TypeScript you can do a function x is a number or something. Mm. Yeah. I can't do that. I need to write a JS doc declaration for that. But this is easily automated. So I don't know. 
don't know. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, they got it coming. Um, damn it, I, I don't want to encode the uh, delete set right now, but uh, actually I want to. Um, dot encode snapshot with v2. Yes, this is the improved um, encoding format. And we don't need an encoder. Not this dot byte length. I and snapshot size. Yes. Okay. So we're basically gonna run the benchmarks right now, and I'm gonna delete everything that we don't need. Um, so I don't want to run this. Um, still big. Really, by the way, um, if you want to, um, if you want to check out the benchmarks yourself, you just run npm start, and it's gonna take like just twenty hours to run, but eventually, you're gonna get a table that sh confirms that YJS is pretty fast. Yeah, um, yeah. But the other one. Just gotta spend those twenty hours. Uh, <laughs> I Very guess important. you have to. That's so um, this is it. This is a delete set. Oh. It's yeah. um, just one client, right? It's my ID. And oh, why I encode. Shouldn't, shouldn't there be multiple clients? Um, no, because the data set only has one client. Basically, it's just one client applying updates. By the way, I'm working with. Um, I, I, I'm currently writing an editor that we can use to write papers because I want to have more data on how users join. So basically, I want to have more clients. I want to support concurrent editing. And I want to be able to, um, if you join a session, you get a new user ID. So I also record that. So basically, I want to be able to better understand how users work on text documents so I can optimize for that. Um, Great. So in the next few weeks, I'm going to publish an editor that is really crappy, but going to give me all the information and which will allow me to write uh, better uh, benchmarks uh, okay. with real world editing data sets. Yeah, I'm okay. really excited for that. I really want more benchmarks too. But, hmm? but yeah, so, so the answer is it, it's only 5K. Five, 5K, five five yes, cool. that, that's it. Okay. For, for this huge data set, it's 5K. It's Okay, yeah. and um, the whole document is encoded in 160K. Yeah. So um, I don't know, if for me 5K is not enough. I, I, I don't wanna optimize for that. I don't wanna send differences between the delete set, although I probably could, but I don't want to uh, because- Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, yeah. I, in most cases, you're gonna sync the whole delete set anyway. It has so many advantages. Um, yeah, just encode it like that. This is my opinion. You can, of course, implement it differently. It just feels uh, good. Oh, by the way, that's all. I, think I, you're know, right. I know, but just... a, another thing is like if you represent uh, deletions as part of the struct store, you mm -hmm. can't always merge stuff, uh, which is another uh, thing. Um, I always merge because stuff. Uh, if I write character A, B, and mm -hmm. then delete something and mm -hmm. then write character C, Mm -hmm. I can't merge A, B, C because C would have a different clock than B, and yeah. you know I can yeah, merge yeah. these. Yeah, um, but but you you usually won't do that. That's not really like I, if I, I I'll often type A, B, then hit backspace and then hit C, but you can't merge that either. Yeah. So yeah, but I it's it's true. It's true. No, I I can merge that because uh, in this scenario I'm going to create a delete operation, and but my clock will stay the same. I don't no, increase but, clock but it, deletion. But you'd end up with uh, with an item for A, then a deleted item for B, and then an item for C. Yeah, but as soon as I delete item C, I'm going to end up with one item without content. And uh, you're muting. Uh, you're muted for me. I don't know what happens. Um, cool. Anyway, we've talked about a lot of different things. Is there anything else that we need to that you want to cover before we wrap up? Um, we've been going for three hours now, can... which is quite a long time. Oh wow. Okay, maybe, maybe we can uh, quickly recap everything, just mm -hmm. check if Great. we handled everything. So um, we talked about items, talked about a bit about types and how different types use the same list CRDT. Um, XML's just a collection, uh, just the same representation of the same model. 
Um, we talked a bit about um, how document updates are written and how the state vector worked. Um, um, we talked like how document updates are constructed. Document updates are the list of missing items plus a delete set. Um, and I hope I convinced you a bit that delete set is awesome. Um, then we have, I mean, relative positions is basically a, a way to refer to a, to a character, to content, um, which is really cool if you wanna, I don't know, something like shared cursors, or if you wanna refer to a range of text and assign meaning to it. For example, if you have a comment and um, you wanna assign a comment to a range of text, this is what uh, relative positions are about. Uh, snapshots are a thing in YJS. They are used to calculate differences. We talked a bit about snapshots and how uh, structs and items are uh, cleaned up after each transaction. And there is uh, one another thing. Uh, we don't have to go into this, but it exists and it doesn't need to be ported if, if uh, so if there's ever a YJS port, it basically just to have um, the item implementation, it doesn't even need to understand how types work. They just, it just needs to understand how items work, which is a very minimal implementation for concurrency. Um, all right, there are, there's an optimized rep, uh, encoding format now, which is the V2 encoder, which uses hourly encoding. And there's the, um, the other encoder that I use. Um, it's the V1 encoder, which is the same thing but just uses variable length encoding, um, which is, yeah, uh, which is an impl implementation here. Um, if you're interested in encoding techniques, this would be a whole other topics. Um, it uses an encoding format that I created just for YJS. And um, uh, it's also using a library that I just created just for YJS, uh, lib0, um, which is a bunch of really performant utility functions that I test a lot. Um, I'm yeah, actually sharing this uh, with um, you know, with Martin and the auto merge project. Like, if if you made things that are better than what they've been working on, like, yeah, yeah, I I, I suggested that in the um in the performance branch because I already implemented the uh, variable length encoding using standardized methods, and uh, now it also has really a performant run length encoding, and I have. I developed a few techniques to make JavaScript code run fast, right? Yeah. And it's it's really hard to understand how JavaScript works. Nothing is like it seems. For example, yeah. um, you say that maps are really efficient, but no, uh, some people think that maps in JavaScript are efficient, but if you, maps have restrictions, especially in JavaScript. And um, there are other implementations. You can, um, YJS uses just an array in binary search. Uh, we talked about that this is, I think this is the best approach or one of the better approach to index data um, in the struct store. Um, there are other techniques like other B tree implementations, but the thing is um, you want to have a tree implementation or a data structure that allows you to index data with um, append operations being an O of one. So they need to be performed in constant time, which is something that is easily done using arrays. But I think in the future, I wanna use a different data structure for that as well. I, um, in lib zero, I started this project, like a fill tree, which allows O of one appends, which is basically a red black tree um, that supports appends, efficient appends to the structure. Um, I mean, there's so much going on and the coolest thing we haven't even talked about, and I don't think we should because, I mean, I will eventually write a blog post about this. Yeah. Um, it is about testing CLDTs mm -hmm. and um, creating simula simulations. Um, it's a, I think it's a big topic for me. It is um, how I started this project and how I can assure that uh, documents will always sync, uh, and always converge with other peers. It's a big it's project. Basically, simu yeah, yeah. Uh, actually, you came up with this uh, father approach for first, I think. Oh. Uh, uh, you also do. Do you also do simulations in ShareJS, ShareDB? Um, I think I only do the fuzzer and then whenever I found okay. the fuzzer found things, I'd add them to a big list of mm -hmm. your explicit test cases that we run every time. Um, yeah. A fuzzer is something really cool that you can do for OT implementations. And to a certain degree, you can also do that with CRDTs. 
but if you have a peer-to-peer -peer, um, peer-to-peer network, you don't know how peers are connected with each other. You can't really make assumptions in which order things come in. Well, that's okay. That's um, what the fuzz is random functions for. Just yeah? make it randomly oh, pick. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. I mean, but I guess in your scenario, you can create. I guess it's easier for you to create. For me, it's just a simulation of like n clients collaborating yeah. with each other over a really weird network protocol. It's like a chess game where, yeah. okay, um, let's assume this client syncs with that one and then sets an operation to this one, but this uh, connection breaks up and, you know, it's a simulation. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, my fuzzer does exactly that. I, I have like, I create three oh. different three different peers and then have them all generate okay. current operations and then have them sync to each other in different orders to make sure that it all comes out correctly. Um, oh, that's cool. Yeah. Um, I guess, yeah, uh, yeah, I mean, it's probably the same concept. For me, it's yeah, a it's simulation for you as its father. Um, yeah. yeah, for me, it, it's actually like, um, I think your approach is um, faster because you can generate just the operations. Um, yeah. For me, there's additional logic because I, for example, uh, you can repeat a simulation because every simulation is generated using a random number generator that I also implemented just for YJS. Um, there's, there's just so much stuff that I implemented in the six years of development of YJS. I, I get uh, it. Which is all part, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and it's the same stuff for you, right? There's so much experience that you have, hmm. uh, how you can test uh, systems. And I think fathers, or simulations are really the thing to um, test concurrent systems. You need a way to test concurrent systems because a proof is not going to cut it. A proof is always up to it for interpretation. It always only tests a small part of the system, right? Yeah, yeah. It only tests the seven lines of code that I use for concurrency resolution in the YATA paper. Um, even if this, uh, this proof is correct, which I think it does prove what it proves, but I'm not sure if that proves correctness of a CLDT. Yeah. And even uh, uh, proof um, um, of the CLDT model, uh, as some people do for RGA or other things, they don't really prove that uh, implementation is correct. Right. So you need yeah. to do simulations yeah, or fathers, uh, stuff like that. Yeah, yeah so this is uh, basically what I do here. And cool. it's a really cool testing approach. Yeah. Um, yeah, we didn't talk about the, the format of how maps work, but it sounds like it's just a list. Is it like an in-order list of all of the... You mean the map we... that indexes the items, right? The map that indexes the items. So if I want to store, if I want to use YGS to store a map, like store an object, a JavaScript object. Um, oh, okay, okay, okay. Um, yeah, we can go over that. So uh, this is the map. It uses the abstract type. Uh, and we went through this map. Um, yeah, it's so that, a reference. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a reference to a linked list. And the last item of the linked list is the current value of the map. Right. So if two users concurrently insert an item into the map, then we do we ignore all of the ones except for the last one. Exactly. Yeah. And we mark everything that is not the last item as deleted. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, this allows us to, I mean, because of the optimizations in YJS, this is pretty efficient. Yeah. There are CRDT implementations that are more efficient than this sequence CRDT for a map. But the thing is, um, why I prefer this approach is um, I want to be able to go back in time and restore an old value. Um, and I want to do that efficiently. I want to basically be able to iterate through the history of the map. And I can do that with this implementation because the history is unique because there's a unique order for this history. Yeah. And I, I like that. The overhead is not that significant, but this yeah. map implementation is not the most efficient one. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. That's um, yeah. Okay. And so, so you've got maps and lists and XML like data structures. Um, mm -hmm. You don't have anything like you don't support like, moving objects inside a, a inside the XML tree or anything like that, I assume? Uh, I don't support move operations uh, for several reasons. If you go to the discussion board in YJS, uh, there's a thread about move operations in YJS and why I don't want to implement a move approach that is uh, similar to what Martin implemented in AutoMerge. 
Um, I think it's pretty cool, but you can achieve the same thing in a different way using a different representation of the same data uh, without doing move operations. Um, another thing is that it's really hard to calculate the diff if you have a if you want to support move operations. So how would I represent? Uh, I moved this range of text to a different position. By the way, the move operation that is um, currently implemented in AutoMerge doesn't support uh, moving ranges of text. It just supports moving a single character, which I think is not satisfying, at least to me. Yeah, so um, the use case, in, use case in ShareJS and ShareDB for that was, um, was mm -hmm. being able to implement workflowy or things like that, where like you've got a series of nested lists of items. So I don't really care about moving characters in a string. It's fine. Yeah. But like moving items in a list, um, yeah. And then being able to. Uh, you're right. Hmm? This is like the most interesting um, uh, thing, I think, about this. And there are different ways to implement that using the list CRDT. Mm -hmm. and, and also in the future, like I'm currently working on a set um, type, which is basically just a set of items, um, yeah. uh, which will allow you to. Um, my, my idea is that you can assign priority directly on the data. And then you can always define a unique order on the priority. And you can also move items by redefining priority, which is basically something that um, um, all these interleaving CRDTs do. They define some kind of priority. Uh, for example, Figma uses a similar approach. Just go to this uh, thread, and I guess yeah, I explained it much better there. Cool. Yeah. Um, uh, so yeah, this is the reason why I don't do that yet, uh, because I want, if I ever implement a move um, operation in YJS, I want to be able to move chunks of text. And also it needs to support the rich text format that is uh, in YJS. So if I move a range of text, I expect that the text retains the formatting attributes. And that would be much, uh, it would be really, really hard to implement correctly this. So I don't want to support it yet. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Cool. Um, yeah, uh, and so we're going through the. <laughs> I, I'm terrible. I just keep on bringing up like different distracting, you know. Oh, what about this thing? No, go um, ahead. <laughs> uh, go ahead until we've been going for three hours. <laughs> um, <laughs> cool. So we, yeah, so we've covered a lot of things. We covered a lot. We didn't cover all the XML stuff, but I, I think it kind of makes sense. Um, we covered like uh, doc and we covered all the abstract types and structs. We covered the, um, the struct store separate from the linked list. And we talked a little bit about some of the encoding methods and how um, objects are encoded. Um, we briefly covered and talked about the network protocol in terms of like being able to send um, uh, send a list of all of the updates uh, from the struct mm -hmm. store um, and just send them mm -hmm. over the wire um, in an encoded like run length encoded kind of way, um, mm -hmm. and to be able to sync that up, which I think makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, yeah. Do you know what like? <laughs> You bring up the network protocol. Um, yeah, it's it's really just that. There's the protocols, um, why protocols implementation um, that defines a lot of operations for this protocol. Basically, it's a sync step one and sync step two. Um, the, the last thing that I want, just want to give a reference about is that um, cursor awareness information like presence information, the fact that you are currently present, uh, currently collaborating with me, and the location of your cursor, um, this is handled through this through a different protocol. I don't even care how this is handled. And the reason for that, um, um, I don't want to make cursor locations part of the YJS model. Yep. I think cursor locations are part of the YJS, of the model in auto merge which, um, I mean, you move cursors around so much, it doesn't really make sense to make them part of the model. So instead, they're just references to content, uh, to the unique identifiers in the model. And um, I use a different state-based CRDT to propagate awareness information. Um, awareness information is basically just you propagating the current state of your document to all clients. And you assign a clock to your state. So if I have like, I know that uh, Seth is currently at state one and I receive state zero from Seth, I'm gonna ignore it. But if I'm gonna receive state six, I'm gonna update my local state of Seth. And also your state is gonna time out after I think 30 seconds. So even if, yeah. I, if there's some delay, 
Um, I'm going to just ignore that you are present because I don't know if you are present yeah. uh, because you haven't uh, told me that you are present. So this is the um, awareness protocol, which is completely protocol independent. I use it in client server models, but also in, in peer to peer models, which yeah. makes, which is what this was developed for. Yeah, makes complete yeah. sense. Yeah, cool. Um, yeah, yeah, we, we made the same choice with Google Wave. Um, yeah. yeah, ran simulations. We're like, yeah, the, adding the customer information like adds like six times as much size to all the documents. Like, let's never do that. Um, right. Yeah. I, I guess it's cool to figure out where your cursor was the most. So I can, Not really. I can know. Like, no. Well, I mean, it wouldn't it be interesting to know where Sophie, uh, where Seth worked on? Like, oh, you were mainly interested in that part of the document. Why didn't you read my introduction? Um, I guess so you can uh, you can actually fake that though if you want to replay cursors by just like okay. looking at the users edits and then moving the cursor to wherever they, whenever they edit something to the last edit and you don't get all the oh, idle yeah. like clicking around but nobody really cares about yeah. it right just be like oh no we just trimmed it for uh you know so that you can take the <laughs> to play the replay uh, fair enough <laughs> fair enough yeah I, I thought Google was about tracking stuff okay <laughs> um. <laughs> well no Google cancels wave right there it's like not enough tracking. That's, that's, that was the one big true. <laughs> oh, no. But like seriously, um, like just from a concept, I think Wave was it was so cool. My university, uh, this is by the way how it got started mm. with uh, shared editing collaboration because um, we had this role SDK at my university and I was a student helper at, like, at my institute. I was working for this institute uh, very early in my uh, studies. And um, uh, I was forced to work on this product, which is basically Google Wave, but in a peer-to-peer -peer manner. Uh, mm, so cool. this is where, yeah, where this comes from. I, I think it, it, it's it's still a cool, a neat idea. This I, which is I would still really love it. Yeah, it's something yeah. I really want. But um, yeah, I think that'll be a, a discussion between us for another time. I think. <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, thanks for uh, for. Uh, asking all these questions. And, oh, and uh, thanks for taking the time to go through it all. This has been, um, this has been tremendous. And I feel like I've really got a clear sense of how YGS works and how you're thinking about it now, which is really great. Uh, awesome. Obviously almost perfect, if only the delete system worked differently. <laughs> yeah, I guess there are um, different opinions about that. And, and really like there's, um, there are so many trade-offs and it's just choosing the right trade-offs uh, yeah. basically. For, for anything for the CRDT algorithm, the way you index stuff and so many trade-offs, just one implementation. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Although I feel like it, at some point, like this stuff's, you know, like, I, I don't know, I'm imagining a version of all of this in Rust and then like based mm -hmm. on the benchmarks, right? We're talking about millions of operations a second, like in the microsecond range. And at that point, mm -hmm. it, it, you know, like a lot of the performance trade-offs stop mattering, um, which is really great. It's something I'm really excited That's about right. at some point. Um, you know, be it yeah. YJS or Automerge or something else, but yeah. Right, I, I always, I'm so curious to know, uh, to find out how fast YJS is compared to other native implementations of CDTs, because it's really an unfair comparison uh, in the web world, because I just do so many micro optimizations, so yeah. I'm naturally faster than others, yeah. um, but uh, with that's, a native implementation. So that's it's not a, well, I guess it's an unfair comparison just from the perspective of the algorithm. Um, like, but like, actually, that is that's a totally fair comparison. They should have made the micro optimizations if they want to be fast. Like, I don't know. I guess that's right. Yeah, it's also a question of choosing the right um, data structures that are right for this environment. Yes. I guess um, if I had infinite amount of memory, I would also use different data structures, but I don't, which is why I use other data structures. For example, the cache. Yeah. Um, I don't want to use too much memory. I read um I read a paper years ago that was that just made me furious and it was like someone it was a you know like a honor student or like a master student comparing OT to a bunch of different CRDTs and yeah. his implementation of OT was terrible and like his performance numbers were like on the order of about a thousand times slower than than how fast JJS worked and and then he was like oh look OT's too slow to use in practice and it's like I mean no. <laughs> if you everything badly then yes everything's too slow to yeah. use in practice like I don't yeah. know. That's not the I, I also, hmm? I, I don't remember which paper it was, but it wasn't a serious one, but I see a lot of papers comparing a Python implementation with some C++ implementation, which is like, 
what are you doing? I mean, Python, uh, that, that's so unfair. You could just implement bubble sort in, in, Py yeah. in C++. It would be faster than Python, right? It's yeah, well, this, this OT implementation, they didn't do any run-length encoding. So like at one point, they, they got a real editing session. And then at one point, okay. one of the users like cut and pasted some, some text. And like, it took like five seconds of CPU time to process the operations because of how, in, you know, how bad their performance was for this one copy paste. Right. Like, you know, like this is not a problem in the algorithm, you know? Right, right. Um, yeah. yeah anyway. and, and by the way, it's also doesn't really matter. Like, um, yeah, what's, you shouldn't start worrying about these micro, about single operations because single operations and performance of that doesn't really matter as long as it is reasonable. What matters more is applying a bunch of operations at the same time, um, which is also what I go through this blog post, but I guess there's more knowledge to share. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, we need better benchmarks for, for this kind of stuff. We do. I yeah, I really like the idea of having a little editor. It's something I've been, I wanted to do on and off and then just never got around to doing. So yeah, I mean, that would be useful for all of these things, right? Like if we've got a common set of, of like, you know, example editing data, and then we can just pull it up and be like, great, well, I've, I made a new CIDT. I made a new, you know, I ported this to Rust. Like, yeah, I ran through all of the standard tests, and this is this is what the performance looks right. like. Yeah, this this should be. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Anyway, um, thank you so much. much. I'm gonna go. <laughs> <laughs> I know uh, it's probably late for you. Um, yeah, thanks again for going over this. Uh, it was really fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I really enjoyed it too. And um, and yeah, I'll, I yeah, um, at some point I'll chop out the bits of us. You know the when the audio cut out and things, and now I'll throw this on YouTube. So. Sounds yeah. good. Um, yeah, let me know when you're done. I'm really excited to, uh, yeah, listen to this again. This four three hour recording. Then okay, I uh, do have a good night. Um, <laughs> sleep have well. A good day. Cool. All right, catch you bye later. Bye. bye.